That was The Cornish Curse by Joe Silver. Read by Rose Robinson. Produced by Elliot Frisby at Monkey Nut Audiobooks. With post production by Angus MacDonald and Janet Davy. A HarperCollins audiobook. Text copyright Joe Silver 2023. Production copyright 2023 by HarperCollins Publishers. All rights reserved. Joe Silver asserts the moral right to be identified as the author of this work. Thank you for listening. Dedication. Dedicated to Emily and Adrian Clark. Legends. If I really don't like somebody, I kill him. Deep Water by Patricia Highsmith. Prologue. Nighttime, and the scene is set to perfection. A fox barks from the direction of Pengelly Lane, while a woman stands atop Logan Rock, encouraging her long velvet cape to billow in the breeze. With her arms outstretched and head thrown back, she beckons a low-lying sea mist ashore to join the party. A murder of crows, not so named for nothing, takes flight from deep within Sam Penhale's wood. That'll be the fox, no doubt. And somewhere in the distance, a badger digs his razor-sharp claws into the spleen of a cornered rat, while his friend, the barn owl, happily disembowels yet another small, screeching, writhing, defenceless animal, eating it alive until its heroic little heart finally beats out its last teeny tiny pulse. And the meek shall inherit the earth, they say. Of course they will. The Wrecker's Lantern, the torch from an iPhone 11 bought for an absolute steal from eBay last week, is especially bright and clear as it swings above the mist, encouraging the prize, Jack Crowless, away from Penberth Cove and along the coastal path towards his destination, Logan Rock. The rock is a majestic headland that thrusts itself into the Atlantic Ocean like the prow of a Cornish ship and is drenched in local legends such as pirates, smugglers, wreckers, giants, and, of course, Poldark. Proper job. The wrecker watches on as Jack Crowless, all credit for his perseverance, stumbles along the coastal path at a pace, drawn in by the light, his right hand acting as a navigational aid, reaching out to touch sharp, wet granite rocks as he edges along the path. The stumbling is on account of him feeling quite queasy by now, and most probably dizzy, what with being drugged. Silly Jack. If only he'd pause for a moment, if only he'd halt to rest his back against the rocks and have a bit of a think, he would realise that his eyesight is not all that it should be, and that his mouth is excessively dry. He would also realise that the exotic image of the figure he sees holding the lantern ahead of him, a mashup of Little Red Riding Hood and a Minotaur, with an exotic bird of paradise swooping figures of eight around its head, is not the purveyor of all his wildest hopes and dreams, but the exact opposite. In fact, not Little Red Riding Hood at all, but a wolf, and a wolf very definitely wearing sheep's clothing. But never mind that now. It's time to dance, and dance to music he knows well. Enter Sandman, Metallica. But this is brilliant. He's dancing on the footpath. And why not? What a promise he's had. It's a promise that will finally satisfy Jack's ultimate fantasy, and it will be handed to him, no doubt he can barely believe it, on a plate the lucky devil. The rasping voice rings out in the darkness, speaking just three little words. Are he ready, Jack Crowless? Okay, five little words. Oh, I be ready, comes the reply. And, like an overly excited dog, with his mouth gaping open and his green eyes wide, so wide, in fact, that the whites are now almost completely obscured by the pupils, Jack Crowless 
transforming himself into a trusting child, raises his arms to the heavens and reaches upwards, and with his prize in sight, he begins the final clamber to the top of the rock. Which is when a huge slab of cold metal slaps him across the head, and within a moment he is falling, 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 the ridiculous muscles in his arms now powerless as he claws into the night, the realisation dawning as he looks up that he's been in a trance. A stupid, idiotic trance. That he's been duped. Or doped, rather. And when the final words of magic, Siri, enable torch, ring out into the darkness and the lantern is relit, The mask slowly slips away, leading him to yell just a few, profound, one might say, little words into the damp night air. I'll kill you, you crazy psychopath! A splash echoes across the clifftops. The wrecker smiles the smile of sweet revenge and turns for home. Kill me, Jack Crowless? I don't think so. Chapter One, Donna. Just before sunrise, on a rocky outcrop by the Art Deco Lido in Penzance, Donna Nightshade, known as Deadly to her mates, sits alone in a powder blue VW camper van and waits. Her focus is soft as she gazes towards St. Michael's Mount. Her middle fingers and thumbs are softly touching in a meditative trance and as the first sliver of golden light breaks out above the horizon and the sun's golden fingers reach out to tap an electric dance on the lapping tide, a sleek line of heavenly stillness steps out of the camper, stretches towards the stars, slips off her surfer's robe, and falls, like a sharp dart of feline perfection, into the shimmering yet icy sea. Fifteen minutes. That's all it takes for Deadly to swim to the end of the rocks and back again. The first shock of cold offering an electric bolt of endorphins that no drug has ever matched. And it is that feeling of complete physical presence within her own body that Deadly craves now. It is a euphoria as necessary as the rhythmic breath of life, which is why every morning, rain or shine, Donna Nightshade puts on her distinctive swimming costume with tongues of flaming fire licking from navel to throat. And as she dives into the mirror sea, she shatters her demons and baptizes herself in the deep, whispering waters so inexorably entwined with her dark, ancestral past. My sister puts down the newspaper and glances up, looking anxious. What a heap of crap, I say, referring to the garbage she's just read out. I don't swim every morning, and how can I gaze at something if my focus is soft? That journo is trying too hard with his writing. Fact. I'm standing at my workbench in a large but crumbling Victorian glasshouse in the walled garden of my ancestral home, Penberth. Penberth is a 13th century manor house, with 10th century battlements, that nestles in an idyllic valley that runs down to a tiny private fishing cove just to the west of Penzance, where pirates, like us, come from. My younger and only sister, Lamorna, is sitting on the opposite side of the workbench and is reading aloud from the local newspaper. With a hand-tied bouquet of homegrown meadow mix in my left hand and a bright orange dahlia varietal called Mrs Eileen, a good doer, apparently. Lucky Mrs. Eileen. In my right, I put aside my rising temper for a moment and concentrate on the bouquet. I thread five long stems of Mrs. Eileen into the bunch, and then, bouquet complete, I tie them off with raffia, place the flowers in a metal bucket on the bench, and reach across to take the Penzance packet out of my sister's hands. My eyes run over the article while Lamorna returns to playing the harp. Cornish and handily lapsized. She's playing Secret Love Song by Little Mix in a soft, understated, angelic way, which isn't surprising because that's Lamorna in a nutshell. Soft, understated, 
angelic. She can play the fiddle too, and the guitar and the piano. Lamorna didn't bother with school, which means that her dedication to providing a musical accompaniment to all aspects of my life is thorough. She has a song and instrument to match my every mood, every thought, every event, and it's really annoying, but what can you do? She means well. Back to the article. The sun's golden fingers, I say. Who the hell writes that way? It's the local rag, not the year nine literature prize. I tap the table hard with my right forefinger. That journalist is going down in my book. In fact, Ruby? Ruby? I look up to the rafters of the glass house where our pet macaw usually hangs out. There she is. Find Donna's book, I say. There's a good girl. Find Donna's book. Shut off, squawks Ruby. Lamorna stops playing. Her hands rest on the harp strings. She looks at me. To be fair, the moment is worthy of the dramatic pause. Your book, she repeats quietly, her eyes swimming with several complex emotions. You mean your actual book? I return to the bunch of flowers and start to fiddle. Yes. Isn't that a little... severe? Ruby? Ruby? I shout again, not answering Lamorna, who has returned to her harp and is now playing Pity Party by Melanie Martinez. She's trying to tell me, not so subtly, that I'm being a bit precious. Ruby lands on my shoulder. Hello, Poppet, I say. Where's my book? She flaps her feathers, which is Ruby's version of a shrug. Find Donna's book, I say, batting her off my shoulder. Go on, lazy bones, find Donna's book. An avian eye roll later, Ruby takes off. About Ruby. Ruby is a macaw, which is a long-tailed bird of paradise with a big beak, not to be confused with a common or garden parrot. She has a bright red body, a plume of multicoloured feathers, and is totally cool. Her beak is hooked, and the colouring around her right eye is black, and, by some wonderful quirk of nature, perfectly formed into the shape of a patch, which is handy, given our family history. The moment I stumbled across Ruby on a pre-loved website, I was hooked, which was good news for Ruby because... With a dirty cackle of a laugh, a foul mouth, and the badass attitude of a Hollywood diva, she wasn't going to be rehomed easily. The previous owner was an old lady in Plymouth who boozed it up every night down the dockyard and whose drinking buddies taught Ruby some colourful language. Always on the lookout for a marketing ploy, Penberth Manor has never paid its way. I at once introduced Ruby to social media. Or rather, I introduced social media to Ruby. She's trending on Twitter this week. Hashtag who's a pretty girl then, and has 50,000 followers. But all that notoriety does make Ruby rather difficult to live with. And the only way to keep her reined in is to threaten to put her in my book. Which I would never do. But she doesn't know that. And anyhow... It's always best to let everyone, including McCaws, think that your mental health is slightly on the edge. It saves the bother of being asked about later. About my book. The first-born woman of every generation of the Nightshade family is named Bella Donna Nightshade, and subsequently known as Donna or Deadly. And it's lucky, because Nightshades seem predisposed to give birth to females. Thanks to our own interpretation of primogeniture, which favours women, each Donna Nightshade is also the heir to the Penber throne. Moi aussi. We share the surname Nightshade with a poisonous plant from the Solanaceae family, a plant more commonly known as Deadly Nightshade. Its Latin name, which I prefer, is Atropa Belladonna and it runs rampant in a wild patch behind the glasshouse at Penberth. As an interesting aside, 
Bella Donna also means beautiful lady in Italian, which is nice. With a lineage that dates to Agincourt and a family history that includes more than a little swashbuckling and during do, there have been quite a few deadly nightshades over the years. I'm Deadly Nightshade the 13th. Lucky for some. My Auntie Donna was the last woman in charge, but I didn't have to wait for her to die to get my hands on Penberth, because she's presently indisposed. And by that, I mean that she's in prison on Bodmin Moor on account of being certified insane. It's not a high-security prison, although she's not allowed to leave. What happened was that poor old Auntie Donna took her name too literally in her younger days and got into more than a bit of bother with a man called Jack Crowless. In fact, she married him and subsequently tried to kill him. But unlike other nightshades before her, she wasn't good enough at covering up her tracks. I took on the mantle of monarch when I turned 18, being the oldest daughter of the next generation of nightshade women, although not the actual daughter of the previous deadly, the one in prison, as she has no children. My own mother, dead, was a younger sister to the last deadly, the one who's in prison. I do have another aunt, Carenza, who hasn't bothered having children. My pelvic floor is too precious, darling. And is Aunt Deadly's identical twin. She's an absolute pussycat. Carenza lives here in the family manor with Lamorna and me, and we also have Uncle Jago living with us too. Real name, Marden Lucius Nightshade V, who is named after a saint from Wales, and whose name means either mad, fortunate or lucky depending on which site you go to on the internet. But we just call him Jago. Every Belladonna nightshade buys herself a book. A journal, if you like, on the day she assumes command. Mine has a nice Liberty Print cover. It's an important document in which we're expected to chronicle the events of our lives for future generations to ponder over and, presumably, learn from. This habit began with the very first Belladonna Nightshade, who was the grand dame of the brood and revered by the rest of us as a goddess. This journal is the place where secrets are kept and helpful hints and tips are passed on. I am therefore duty-bound to write down the name of any person declared a sworn enemy to the family. The name of the perpetrator is written down on the back page, if there's room, and a line is drawn through the name. Preferably in blood, but these days a red sharpie will do. Strange things tend to befall those who are unfortunate enough to go down in the book. And they really do. Honest to God, it's weird. But maybe it's not so surprising, because in going down in the book, they automatically receive Ye Wrecker's Curse, also known as ye curse of the deadliest of all ye black pirates. We're such a pleasant family. The book works on suggestion. A bit like voodoo, but without a shaky rattle or a witch doctor. And although no one outside the Nightshade family has ever clapped eyes on the book, the local population choose not to get on the wrong side of us. Just in case. The Cornish do love a bit of legend. But back to the glass house, where Ruby is looking for the aforementioned book. The elephant still lingers in the room, the newspaper article, and I lean across the table to grab it. Lamorna, who is the gently running brook to my Niagara Falls, continues playing the harp. It doesn't even make sense, I say, scanning the page with the speed and unsettledness of a victim of atropine poisoning. And he might as well have sent up an aircraft over Penzance trailing a banner with deadly as a druggie written on it. Was a druggie, my sister corrects, stilling the strings on the harp again. I assess a photograph, of me practically naked, that takes up most of the page. I just knew that journalist was a weasel, I say, narrowing my eyes. He had one of those... Weaselly faces, you know? Lamorna shuffles on her stool. 
I thought he looked quite attractive when I saw him, she offers. Not that he'd float my boat, obviously. She puts fingers to strings again and moves on to Ariana Grande's Dangerous Woman. I grab a dustpan and start to tidy my workbench, but pause with the brush halfway across the table. What do you mean, when I saw him? My sister doesn't often venture much beyond the manor, except to skip along the coastal path when she's out searching for wildflowers, rare chuffs, unusual moths, sea pixies, that kind of thing. Lamorna progresses from a shuffle to a shrug. Her sweet, pale, heart-shaped face is framed by a mass of copper curls. She stops playing. He was down by the cove the other day. You were in town. I'm sure it was him. Fairly ripped surfer type. Nice hair. I snort. Ripped? Hardly. Decent pins, but ripped? No way. What did he want? No idea. Did you have a go at him? What for? Lamorna can be so hazy sometimes. Trespass, obviously. Did you tell him the cove is private land? Lamorna is doing her usual thing of concentrating more on her harp than her conversation. He was out for a walk along the coastal path and just happened to wander up the valley a little way. No harm done. It was nothing. I grab the cuttings bin from the back of the greenhouse and brush the debris from the table into it. Journalists, dear one, are never out for a purposeless wonder. Never. Lamorna glances up. I thought you said he wasn't a proper journalist. She isn't being sarcastic. Lamorna takes everything literally. It's a spectrum type thing, which is why she's as cool as all hell. I return the bin to where it belongs, sit down, rest my head on one hand, and pick up the newspaper with the other. I examine the image and decide that I look... well, good. Sexy, even. But no, this is wrong. I'm regretting meeting him at the Penzance Lido now. And why on earth did I wear a swimming costume? Lamorna quiets the harp once more. This is how we live our lives. Conversation, music, conversation, music. Rinse and repeat. And just as a negotiator might carefully lean forwards to remove a gun from the fingers of a rampaging psychopath, she reaches across the table and takes the newspaper from me while smiling her understanding at my frustration. I have no idea how she understands me so well. Surely she's too young and innocent to reach into the horror show that often rampages through my mind. I think we should frame it, she says, smiling at the photo. He caught you just right. My expression is unaltered. I am impervious to flattery. And what was it he called you again? Lamorna runs an eye down the column by tracing a finger down the text. A... wait a minute. Here it is. A sleek line of heavenly stillness and a sharp dart of feline perfection. She glances up. A ghost of something bordering on flattered amusement flashes across my lips. I button it up quickly. That's as may be, I say, but it was supposed to be a simple interview for the spotlight feature to drum up business, not a bloody criminal profile. I take a deep breath. I'm going to regret this, but you'd better read on. Forewarned is forearmed, as they say. Ruby swoops by and throws my book onto the bench, just as Lamorna begins the next paragraph. She approaches me in her swimsuit, a towel thrown over her left shoulder, her right hand outstretched in greeting. The body art on her right thigh draws me in. I'm helpless, fascinated, a scuppered ship heading towards a wrecker's lantern. We sit together at a table by the Lido, and I wait while Donna squeezes the water from her long, gypsy hair. That's when I see the electronic tag on her ankle, an accessory that speaks of a rebellious past. It is covered by a delicate braid of leather, as though she keeps it there as an echo, 
a need to relive the pain of her own and her ancestors, shackled past. Lamorna dares to glance up again. My nostrils are flaring like a tethered dragon. She reads on. But we're here to talk about her new venture. Not the past, she reminds me, because Donna Nightshade has just launched a new business. The Edge of the World Detective Agency. An enterprise that sets her firmly in history as Penzance's very first private eye. Or pirate eye, as I point out. Lamorna breaks off and glances up again. Pirate eye, she repeats. I love that. We should go with that as a logo, not the other thing. She waits for my response. None comes. It's not too late, she presses. I could draw a fab picture. You'd be the pirate, obviously, but instead of an eye patch, you'd have a magnifying glass and a tricorn hat, just like a pirate Sherlock Ho- Forget it. She returns to the article. The new business will run alongside all the other Nightshade Enterprises, one of which is the Pirate Experience, which is run from the Nightshade family boat, a sloop moored in Penzance Harbour. Donna is also CEO of a flower farm and floristry service, both run by the whole family, aunt, sister and uncle, and orchestrated from their business HQ, the family home, Penberth Manor, which is hidden in its very own picturesque valley near Lamorna Cove. The valley runs to the only private fishing cove on that stretch of coast and has been in the Nightshade family for hundreds of years. The Nightshades also run a small theatre company that performs regularly at the Minak Amphitheatre. Isn't it a little unusual, I ask her, this decision to merge floristry with detective work? Not at all, Donna is quick to answer, her elbow on the table, her chin resting on the back of her hand. Florists, she explains, are the keepers of many secrets. The seemingly innocuous handwritten messages written on those little cards hinted all kinds of shenanigans. Flowers are, after all, messengers of the heart. And if crime is linked to emotion, well, Cornwall is rife. Oxford, Midsummer and Shetland can't have all the fun, you know, she laughs. Passion, grief, loss, love, agony, secrets and lies. It's all here, hidden in just a few simple words on a card and stuffed into a bunch of flowers. I'm hoping to pick up quite a few detective agency clients as a direct link to my flower deliveries. Cornwall is a county that is proud of its colourful and passionate history and remains crammed to the rafters with dodgy characters and illicit goings-on, especially around Penzance. Yes, there are a few more pasty and charity shops here nowadays, but it's pretty much remained true to its roguish past. Charity shops. Roguish past. The locals will kill me. I am outraged. I turn to another bucket sitting on the table and grab the initial makings of my next order. I grab my snips, and with the nimble fingers of a surgeon working against the clock, quickly strip a rose stem of its thorns while muttering, he's painted me as a complete tit. Chapter Two Donna. A woman in her fifties floats into the greenhouse to break the mood. She is a woman with the grace and poise of an expensive cat, despite wearing a lollipop lady day glow coat over yoga gear. Note for the non-British, a lollipop lady is someone who willingly throws themselves into the path of oncoming traffic and represents an iconic British institution designed to help school children cross the road safely. Every morning in Britain, thousands of women, and the very occasional bearded man, loiter near primary schools holding metal stop signs in the shape of a lollipop before walking defiantly out into the middle of a busy road during rush hour. With a menacing glance at the driver, she will shove her stop sign in front of a speeding car and with a saccharine smile to the adorable school children waiting patiently on the pavement, she beckons them to cross the road. It's a role Aunt Carenza was not necessarily born to play, but she gets by. 
about Carenza. Carenza is a genuine yogi, as opposed to some woman in her 40s who orders a yoga DVD and finds herself with her legs stuck behind her head, being carted into accident and emergency. I have never joined any of Carenza's popular Ashtanga yoga classes, even though her brand of yoga is regarded as the most rigorous form to practice and would therefore usually appeal. No, I do a kickboxing class twice a week instead, because when the shit hits the fan, as it invariably will for a woman, adopting a tree pose might be restful, but it will be bugger all use against an assailant who grabs you from behind in a dark alley. Or a lit one, for that matter. And as for the downward dog, my eyes water just thinking of the vulnerability associated with that particular pose. Lamorna returns to her harp, while Carenza rests her lollipop stick against the back wall of the glasshouse. She removes her sou'wester hat, which allows a long mass of soft curls the colour of New Zealand's finest manuka honey. Those bees work so hard to trickle over her shoulders. She shakes the rain from her coat while nodding in the direction of the newspaper. You're taking centre stage in every newsagent's in town, darling. Her deep voice is full of sexy breath. Ruby goes into attack mode and starts strafing Carenza. They have a love-hate relationship, those two. Carenza bats her off, rather aggressively for a yogi, but I let it go. But you do realise that half the county will have ejaculated over that image by lunchtime? My head drops into my hands. Only half? interjects Lamorna, snorting. Let's be honest, if she weren't my own sister, I'd do her. Carenza frowns. Don't say do, Lamorna dear, she chides, hanging her coat on a peg. Say have sex, or at the very worst, make love to but never say do. It's every bit as crass as shag or screw. Carenza turns to me and nods to my bouquet. Are these the flowers for June Baker? Yes. And have you seen my knife, by the way? I've lost it. Your knife? The one Auntie Donna gave me. It has my name on it. No, I've no idea where it is. No idea at all. Carenza picks up the previously made bouquet and fiddles with Adelia. Are these the ones we're sending from old man Bosolo? I put down a camellia branch and pick up a couple of sprigs of fern. Yes, why? Carenza hovers by my right shoulder. Then you'll need to put the last of the sweet peas in there too. It's been a great year for our sweet peas, and even now, in September, there are still a few left from a late sowing. Won't the colour clash horribly with the dahlias? I ask. Carenza floats through the glass house and nips outside, dashing through the rain. She returns with a shake of her head and a handful of sweet peas, cut long on the stem. But according to the law of love, the law of love my ass, I say, according to the law of love, she repeats. They bring an abundance of luck and blissful pleasure. She raises her voice a little to be heard from the far end of the glasshouse. And old man Bosolo needs all the help he can get, poor dear. He's desperate for a sh- Carenza floats back towards me, holding the sweet peas. Lamorna stills the harp and glances up. A good time, finishes Carenza. I hold the pale pink sweet peas against the bright colours of the tied bouquet and scrunch up my nose. The candy floss pink clashes dreadfully with Mrs. Eileen. Carenza sighs. You're right, she says, perching on the stool next to me. I'll make a separate little bouquet. We'll call it a special offer. The effect will be the same. Ruby jumps onto the table and offers me a sprig of gypsophila to add to the sweet peas before taking up her own perch on the peg where Carenza's coat hangs. Don't shit on my coat, Ruby, says Carenza, turning to look at her. There's a dear. Carenza titivates the sweet pea posy and notices my book on the table. She looks at Lamorna. I can't see her face, 
but I know she'll have adopted an expression of troubled concern. Lamorna offers a microscopic nod towards the newspaper, while simultaneously arriving at the final bars of Dangerous Woman. I throw a ball of twine across the bench at my sister. It bounces off her head. You were reading, I say. Lamorna swaps harp for newspaper. But if Donna is hoping to find mystery and intrigue lurking in the Penzance underworld, she need look no further than her own family's notorious past. A past infamous for its wreckers, smugglers and thieves. The first thing you need to know about me is that I come from a long line of pirates, she says, before falling silent and throwing me the seductive smile of a temptress. When I ask what the second thing I need to know is, she leans forward, her gaze as steady as a rock, and says, when the first thing to know about me is that I come from a long line of pirates, there's absolutely no need to know anything else. Well, quite. But when considering the notion of a nightshade taking on the role of detective, I can't help but conjure the phrase poacher turned gamekeeper. I say this and she laughs. They do say set a thief to catch a thief, she says, her eyes glistening. But I hope to show that my generation of nightshades has more in common with Robin Hood than Blackbeard. We aim only to do good work in the community these days. That may be so, but this latest venture is a serious departure from the past. And at 30-something, she would not reveal her age. Donna, deadly nightshade, is already a true Penzance legend, with rumour and gossip abounding regarding her teenage exploits. Exploits that cement her place in local history every bit as firmly as the likes of Cutthroat John and Black Hand Bill. When I ask what the local detective sergeant, her childhood sweetheart, Joseph Ennis, thinks of her new venture, a flash of something ineffable crosses Donna's face. Didn't he arrest you on Newland Green years ago? I ask, leading you to spend considerable time at Her Majesty's pleasure. And didn't his great-great-great-grandfather, the local magistrate at the time, arrest your own great-great-great-grandfather at the Admiral Benbow pub, subjecting him to the hangman's noose? Deadly throws back her head and laughs. I can assure you that no one from that particular family has ever kicked any nightshade ass. I was going to correct her by saying that, in fact, by sending her to prison in her late teens, Joseph Ennis had done exactly that. But, whatever the case, if Deadly knows what D.S. Ennis really does think of having a new private eye on his beat, she doesn't say. But there is, I note, at the thought of the detective sergeant, a faraway look on her face and a trace of, is it regret? Affection? Love, even? Stop! I screech. Read that last bit again. Which bit? Which bit? Lamorna glances up at Carenza, aware that in the whole article, this is the bit that will truly grip my shit. But there is, I note, at the thought of the detective sergeant, a faraway look across her face and a trace of, is it regret? Affection? Love, even? That's it! I jump off the bench and cross to a set of pine drawers. Ruby, always one to enjoy a good fracas, jumps onto my shoulder and eggs me on, squawking. A terracotta pot acts as a penholder, and I take a red sharpie from a collection before opening a drawer to rummage through an assortment of crap until I find a ruler. With pen and ruler in hand, I return to the bench and open my book at the last page. I nod towards the newspaper. Carry on. As the interview draws to a close, I ask about the Penberth Players, a local amateur theatre company that is about to stage a performance of a play written by Donna herself called Sleeping Dogs Lie. I confirm that the players are all close friends of Donna's and ask if they are her merry band of men, perhaps. She laughs and says, yes, I suppose they are. We're all very close. She stands then. The meeting is over. 
I can't help but glance at the distinctive tattoo on her thigh. She places her foot on the chair and flexes. Want a proper look? She asks. I do, and I am undone. The tattoo depicts a stem of purple flowers running from knee to hip, the last tendril disappearing into the inner thigh, behind the line of the swimsuit. Body art of a beautiful flower seems fitting for a florist, but then I look deeper and see that the stem weaves its way around a silver cutlass and speaks of a different kind of life entirely, a life that is light years away from the serene idyll of the flower farm at Penberth Manor. For a moment, I think I notice something else too, something hidden deep beneath the cutlass, a scar, perhaps. Donna notices the angle of my inquiring head and removes her tanned, toned leg from view. The show is over, and I know as she slips on her shorts, vest top and flip-flops that this is a woman who will fascinate me long after the interview is over. Who is she, this deadly nightshade? This woman who hides behind layer after layer of legend and is clearly caught up in her own tangled sense of self. As she turns to leave, I quickly ask what motivates her. What motivates a woman to run a flower farm, a tourist ship, a theatre company, and now a detective agency, amongst other things, such as singing jazz and soul music at the Star Inn, Newlyn? Without a moment's pause, she says, Penberth. And as I stare across the pale blue waters of the Lido, with the bitter taste of espresso lingering in my mouth, I remember that still waters run deep and think of Donna's right thigh, that tattoo, that flower. I quickly Google the etymology of the plant and find that deadly nightshade is a chameleon of many uses. It is a plant that can be used either to kill or to cure. It simply depends on how you choose to handle it. Words and Photograph, Jace Clarkson The glass house is silent now, the rain having petered out. Silent except for the scratch of the pen as I write out the name Jace Clarkson in my book. Even Ruby knows it's best to keep stum. Lamorna and Carenza look on, while, very neatly, I draw a line through his name in red. Tis done. My fingers begin to tap out a rhythmic drumbeat on the bench. Lamorna takes the newspaper to the compost bin and shreds it. First rule of composting, shred. Things rot quicker that way. Cabbages, flowers, dead bodies. She doesn't return to the bench, but crosses to a baby grand piano at the far end of the glasshouse. It's a roomy old place, built by an Edwardian deadly. She lifts the lid, cracks her fingers, Lamorna's only annoying habit, and begins to play the introduction to The Fear, Lily Allen. Carenza turns to me with a newly created posy in her hand. A petal falls off. I did say that the sweet peas were past their best. He obviously has the biggest crush on you, she says. What's he like? I open my mouth. Words are spoken, but they aren't mine. Lamorna speaks over the piano to answer for me. Hot, she says, before adding, and Donna's type. If he hadn't been subject to the wrecker's curse, obviously. Lamorna allows herself an amused smile and returns to concentrating on the music. Carenza sighs and pops her posy in the bucket of water. Well, I hope you haven't been a little hasty putting him in your book, she says. You could have had some rare old fun with a man like that, I should think. The woman is deranged. Fun? I add a few sprigs of rosemary to my bouquet as additional filler. The whole arrangement looks like it's had a fight with a bramble hedge, but it is an odd day and I've been distracted. Yes, darling, fun. Lamorna has moved on to the classic Lily Allen line, and I don't know what's right and what's real anymore, while I reach up and stretch. Anyhow, I conclude, it doesn't matter how stunning he is. He's called Jace. 
Lamorna stops playing. So? Both women say together. I take the bouquet back. They wait for an explanation as I add three stems of Michaelmas daisies. Isn't it obvious? I eventually explain. No woman should ever have to scream out the name Jace in the height of passion. It's up there with Des or Peter or Harold. Now you're just naming serial killers, says Carenza, before adding, it wouldn't be a problem for me, the name. I stopped shouting out the name of my lovers ages ago, right after my... She pauses and looks up at the rafters, thinking. Tenth, no, eleventh sexual partner. I look at Lamorna, whose hands hover above the keys. We both wait for an explanation. Why? We ask in unison. Carenza takes the dizzy posy of sweet peas out of the bucket, holds it to her nose and takes a deep breath. The petals scatter like confetti. Because my eleventh lover was Jose. Carenza's eyes betray the fact that her mind has taken a quick stroll down memory lane, which is a pleasant lane by the looks of things, paved with gold and erotica. What a difference a single vowel and an accent on the E can make. Now there's a name to be shouted out in bed. His lovemaking had the majesty of the bullfight mixed with the spirituality of the Catholic Church. Amazing. But I suppose I'm always worried that I might shout out Jose's name by mistake. My mind does tend to drift back to him to get me in the zone sometimes, so to speak. I nod my understanding. My sister pipes up. What happened to him, Auntie Carenza? To Jose? Carenza sighs the sigh of a person recalling a beautiful memory. She shrugs. He moved on, as is the right way of things. Some men should be shared liberally, I think. Never look back in anger, girls. Never look back in anger. She pops the posy back in the bucket. Not if the sex is that good, at least. Lamorna and I make eye contact before Lamorna grabs her guitar, joins us at the bench, and hits the intro to Don't Look Back in Anger by Oasis. Carenza and I sing along to the line, So Sally can wait. She knows it's too late. Etc. Well, it stopped raining, says Carenza, rendition complete. I think I'll head up to the Dahlia field and do a spot of deadheading. She pauses to kiss me on the head. Stop thinking about the article, Donna. I'm not. You are, she says. You're clenching your jaw. Such a bad habit, darling. It's aging, and you'll get all kinds of problems with your neck. I relax my jaw and smile. She strokes my hair and adds, For what it's worth, I think that was a fabulous write-up. She nods towards my book. And I'm sure that your great-great-great-great-great-grandma Donna, that might not be enough greats, but you know what I mean, would be very proud of you. She grabs a truck and a pair of secateurs and heads towards the door. Ruby, having sensed my body relax, decamps to Lamorna's shoulder and perches on the left strap of her dungarees. Carenza pauses by the door. But perhaps let's make sure Uncle Jago doesn't catch sight of it. The article. She turns the door handle. Or he'll be taking the blunderbuss off the wall again to chase after this Jace fellow. And that thing is such a pig to clean. Good, I shout. I wish he would. This family is becoming far too live and let live for my liking. Carenza wafts a final angelic smile our way before turning to step out of the glass house, which is when a hulk of a man wider than he is tall, with a hoop in his left ear and wearing a pair of 1980s cut faded jeans and a heavy metal-inspired T-shirt, steps in. A fraction of a second later, Carenza has dropped the trug and her hands are around his throat. Oh, great. Uncle Jack is back. Chapter 3
A woman stands in front of an altar with her hands in a prayer position and gazes upwards at a big gold cross. The heavy doors of the Church of All Saints, Penberth, are slammed and bolted, and robes are abandoned on the cold stone floor. On the altar sit what seem to be offerings of a vicar's dog collar and a photograph of a naked woman. She bows her head. Dear Lord, begins the woman, which is as good a start as any. I am the way and the truth and the life. I know that you are the all-seeing, omniscient one, and so you alone know what I have become. I have veered from the path of goodliness, godliness and of righteousness, and damnation and regret are to be my burden. Can you ever forgive me? A trapped bird flutters in the rafters suddenly. The woman takes this as a sign that he will, or maybe he will not, forgive her. It's always so difficult to decide with signs. She drops her hands from the prayer position, picks up the photo, and reverses from the altar to take a seat on a pew. Like a motorist that can't help but glance at the car crash on the other side of the road, the woman looks at the photograph before lifting her head to look through blurry eyes at the stained glass window above the altar. God is bearing down on her. And if she's not mistaken, he started to grimace. Well, as much as any man with a beard, white robes, a kind smile and Jesus sandals can bear down and grimace. And she knows that she's just about as deep in the proverbial poo as any woman can be. She also knows that this stained glass image of the big man is nonsense. God is love, after all. Not a middle-aged white man holding a lamb in one hand and a cherub in the other. But still, he seems to have taken on more of a glower over the past few days. And really, who can blame him? Her hands rush to the prayer position again. I promise, one way or another, dear Lord, I will do your will. And that wicked man, that wicked, evil man, will get exactly what he deserves. She drops to her knees. Bloody hell, that floor's hard, she says, before grabbing a prayer kneeler and slipping it under her knees. The hands go up again. Let's call it an occupational habit. And she shouts out in full ecclesiastical glory. And I say unto him, Jack Crowless, may the Lord strike you with Egyptian boils and with tumours, scabs and itch for which you find no cure. It is probably the biblical passage quoted least frequently back to the Almighty on a day-to-day -day basis. But right now, it's all the woman's got. Chapter 4 Donna I prize Carenza off Uncle Jack and rest her against the whitewashed wall that constitutes the back of the glass house. Jack reeks of the 1980s. Stale beer, fags and Paco Rabanne. The more discerning nose would probably pick up a whiff of New Lynn Fish Market too. The aroma visibly follows him as he approaches the bench something with which he is all too familiar. He's back, then. Jack Crowless. Uncle Jack. The man who would be king. I've seen neither hide nor hair of Jack for many years, not since Lamorna was tiny. Lamorna and Ruby pick up on the tension, and I realise that they are probably wondering who this man is. Lamorna puts down her guitar and takes up the Cornish harp again, while Ruby carries out a quick feather ruffle. If it isn't little Donna Nightshade, says Jack, ignoring Carenza completely and glancing around with obvious disdain, his nostrils flaring. All grown up and out of prison. He takes up a position at the head of the workbench and leans backwards against a display stand of exotic plants. The stand wobbles as lots of obvious metaphors flow into my mind. Bad pennies, 
shit on my shoe, an ill wind. Hello, Jack. It's been a while, I say. Lamorna plucks out the opening bars of Scarborough Fair, very slowly and with great feeling. She somehow manages to convey an aura of, is it menace? Yes, it is. And that's not easy with a tune as innocuous as Scarborough Fair. I've had a few things to do, he says, but decided it was finally time to come back to the old homestead. Jack flexes his arms and looks at his biceps, one then the other, which is quite unnecessary, but he's obviously proud of them. He leans forward and places his hands on the table, his jaw tight. I think of advising him to relax his jaw, but sod it. Why offer this idiot any advice? This place is rightly mine, after all, he adds. I'm about to tell him to sling his hook, and that he'll have to take us to court if he wants one sniff of my manner. But then he takes a business card out of his jeans pocket and places it on the table in front of me. I see that it's my business card for my new private detective business. He taps on the card. Pick this up at the wink. That's a pub. And it's funny because i just been thinking to myself, I wonder what my little Donna Nightshade is doing with herself these days. And I seize this card, which is very handy. Very handy indeed. He sniffs and walks around the table, grabbing a stool before sitting down next to me, like he's just rocked up at an American bar. He leans in. His breath is rank. He lowers his voice. Somebody's after me, he says. And you're gonna find out who. Whom, corrects Lamorna, glancing up. I look beyond Jack and notice the family motto that's written in Latin on a piece of wood hanging lopsidedly from one nail above the doorframe. Sum quique. It translates as, may all get their due. And I remember that I'm not 18 anymore. I'm 30-something. And frankly, Jack Crowless, whose own mother, God rest her soul, hated him, can take a running jump off a preferably very high cliff. I'm not interested, Jack, I say. Find some other mug to sort your life out for you. I turn away and start to rise from my stool. It's a mistake. I should have continued to stare him down because I would have won, no question. As a teenager, I had regular staring competitions with my border collie, Schooner, and I never lost. And it's not easy to outstare the type of dog that has literally been bred to win staring competitions with sheep. He grabs my arm, forcing me to sit down again. Then he glances at Ruby and Lamorna before releasing my arm with a smirk. Lamorna has moved on to Spanish dance number one from La Vida Breve. Fast, dangerous, exciting. He runs the back of a finger up my thigh, tracing my tattoo or rather the scar underneath it. He, of all people, knows about the scar. Stopping at the hem of my shorts, he leans in and whispers, Little Miss High and Mighty, ain't you? I notice Lamorna's left eyebrow rise infinitesimally. As an interesting aside, I am yet to meet anyone who can raise their right eyebrow independently from their left. You and that flat-chested bitch, a nod in Carenza's direction, are still the whores you ever were, and you'll damn well do as you're told. Carenza steps towards us, lollipop stick in hand, and thrusts the word stop in front of Jack. But Jack Crowless is no timid motorist. He grabs her arm, rips the sign out of her shaking hands, and throws it across the floor. It lands with a satisfactory clank. He glances up at Ruby, who is still in the rafters, and is being unbelievably quiet, before reaching for an avocado that sits in a bowl of vegetables Lamorna was supposed to prepare for lunch half an hour ago, and asks, 
Did you know avocados are poisonous to parrots? She's a macaw, says Lamorna, her fingers still tickling the strings. What? Ruby is a macaw, not a parrot. There's a difference. Jack turns to me. I think Lamorna disquiets him. And you remember what happens if you don't do exactly as I say, don't you, Queen Bee? He nods in Ruby's direction, smirks again, and whispers two little words in my ear. Woof, woof. I won't give him the satisfaction of a gulp. Fine, I'll help you, I say. But I don't want to talk about it here. I've got a gig at the Star later. We can chat before that. He winks. Winking men are the worst. Good girl he says, and relaxes his jaw. Turning his attention towards Lamorna with a sickening smile, he says, And what's your name? Lamorna stops playing and stares at him, deadpan. Her Titian hair is cascading over her shoulders, and her head is matching the left strap of her dungarees by tipping to one side. Ruby has also jumped onto Lamorna's shoulder and tipped her head to accommodate Lamorna. They stare at Jack for what seems like forever. Then Lamorna lifts her left ass cheek and farts. About Lamorna. The moment Lamorna breathed her first breath, my mother breathed her last. Weeping silent tears at the loss of my worshipped mother, Lilius, I look down at Lamorna in the incubator. Tubes coming out of her nose, cannulas attached her tiny hands a monitor beating out the rapid pulse of her premature heart. And I vowed to keep my little sister safe. Because from the very first moment I looked at her, I knew there was something different, something special about Lamorna. Indeed, for the first two days of her life, I knew with absolute certainty that Lamorna's soul hadn't yet entered her body. That there was a vacantness within the incubator still a pod without a seed. And even though the baby's heart was beating, her soul, or whatever else that thing is that makes a body a conscious being, wasn't there yet. My mother and my sister had clearly met somewhere betwixt and between those two things we call life and death, just to have their moment. On the third day, dozing by the incubator, I drifted into a fitful sleep, and my unconscious mind connected with my mother's spirit. She was holding a baby wrapped in the family shawl. She handed the baby over to me, kissed me on the cheek, and said, Lamorna. When I woke and looked into the incubator, Lamorna opened her eyes, and I knew that she had finally arrived. Although I was only 18 years old at the time, I felt ready to take on the task of caring for a child. It coincided with my ascension to the throne of Nightshade, after all, so I was feeling older than my years as it was. Yes, I ended up in the clink for a while shortly afterwards, but I've been sister and mother to Lamorna ever since my release. I always knew she was a special, unusual, gifted child. A child who could nail a major global issue in a single sentence, and yet found the touch of clothes on her skin irritating. A child who would happily live her life completely naked and open and free, if only the rest of the world would do that too. Truth is, Lamorna doesn't always understand when she's in danger, so I act as a permanent human shield. Like now. My name, she repeats. I'll tell you mine if you tell me yours. Her fingers return to the harp strings. Sonata number two. Allegro. I lean back on the stool so that Jack cannot see my face and shake my head in Lamorna's direction because A, Lamorna doesn't speak that way, and B, it's not a wise decision to dick around with Jack Crowless. Jack laughs and steps around the workbench to stand next to Lamorna. I begin to wonder how long it would take me to run to the library, grab the blunderbuss off the wall, mess or no mess, 
load the thing and shoot Jack right out of the greenhouse and into Kingdom Come. Too long. He visibly eyes Lamorna, ugh, and raises an eyebrow. His left one, see? And now I'm picturing my cutlass. I could run him through in a moment, but it's on the wall next to the blunderbuss. I'm just imagining running florist wire around his throat when he holds out a hand in Lamorna's direction. Jack Crowless, at your pleasure, ma'am. Lamorna takes his stumpy paw, holds it briefly rather than shakes it, and stares at him more intensely now, taking him in. Lamorna Nightshade, she says. Jack turns to me and laughs. A full belly laugh. I feel sick, properly sick. Fucker me, he says. If it isn't the babe in arms, all grown up. He cups Lamorna's chin in his hand and raises her face up to his. There's really no need to do this as she is at his height sitting on the stool, but, as my mother used to say, Jack never did quite get over the fact that he started growing out rather than up when he hit 13. Ruby, now on the right page, lunges at his hand with vicious pecks. Jack swipes out and poor Ruby lands with a thud on the workbench. I reach out to Ruby as she pushes herself onto her knees. Okay, feet. But the glance she flashes me says, I'm fine, don't give him the satisfaction. If I'm not mistaken, there's also a flash of something with a hint of revenge about her eyes too. Lamorna slips off her stool and walks to the dresser drawer where she takes out a printed sheet of paper. She hands it to Jack. These are the daily rates for the Edge of the World Detective Agency, Mr. Crowless, she says. Terms and conditions are written quite clearly on the back. I suggest you glance over them before deciding whether to engage my sister's services. Jack guffaws, throws the paper on the table and steps back, knocking over a stool, which is left rolling on the floor. He turns to face me as he opens the glasshouse door. The star, later. And don't forget. He nods towards Ruby, or maybe even Lamorna. I can't be sure. Woof, woof. The scrunch across the gravel confirms that he's gone. What a cock. Carenza puts down the lollipop stick, picks up the stool, and drops down next to me. Her posture has gone to ratchet for the first time in a decade. Well, is the only word she manages. As for Lamorna, she returns to her harp, her deft hands flying across the strings to the sound of Toccata and Fugue in B minor. Fast, feverish, intense, with a hint of excitement and danger too. There is an expression on her elfin face that I can't quite fathom. Ruby is more straightforward and sums up my feelings exactly by jumping onto the doorframe and screeching out her favourite maritime word after Jack as he exits the garden. Anchor! She squawks. You got that right, Ruby. You got that right. Chapter 5 With a fresh cup of street trader coffee in one hand, a buff file in the other, and an almond croissant hanging from his mouth in a paper bag. Detective Sergeant Joseph Ennis of the Penzance Constabulary closes the door to his office with an elbow shove and returns to his desk. An aspidistra claws for breath in a corner and fishing rods lie in a wall in a space that would be light and airy if only the council would ever pay for the windows to be cleaned. He sits down on a chair that was designed to be ergonomically beneficial but has never been levered into quite the perfect position and stares at two pictures sitting on his desk. Both pictures are of Donna Nightshade. It's not unusual for Joe to start his day seeing pictures of Donna, but they're usually in his mind and are images of a vibrant teenager smiling up at him, invariably wearing a bikini and sitting on his boat as she used to do a long time ago before he got put into her book. 
Not that he knows for certain that he's in there, but come on. He put her in prison, actually put the cuffs on, and others have gone into her book for far less than that. With the croissant hovering an inch from his mouth, he shakes his head and sighs. One photo of Donna is the shot from the newspaper article. The other was left on his desk by his sergeant, having been handed in by the editor of the local rag this morning. In the photo from the editor, taken last evening, apparently, Donna is sitting in a dark corner of the Star Inn, Newlin. To be fair, all the corners of the Star are dark. Talking to a thick-set man called Jack Crowless. The bane of Joe's life is back in town. Just brilliant. His phone rings. Joe looks at the screen. It's the editor of the Penzance packet, Bill Smiley. He lets it ring out. He's got a newspaper article from yesterday's rag to read, a pastry to eat, and Bill is on his naughty list. Joe shakes his head in disdain while reading the article. A flash of a memory of Donna at primary school crosses his mind. It's a memory of her dragging Billy Jacobs across Mousehole Harbour by his hair and throwing him into the sea because he'd mimicked her uncle, who was, is, in his eccentricity, an easy target. Just the week before, Uncle Jago, known locally as the Captain, had been found brandishing a blunderbuss from his vantage point on the roof of the Admiral Benbow pub while on the lookout for the Royal Navy Police. Joe reaches a part in the article about Donna's faraway look. Really? A faraway look? For him? Nah. He smiles all the same. The phone rings. It's Bill again, and it's a video call. Joe hates video calls. What's on? says Bill. What's on is what the Cornish say to each other in greeting. It's a bit like the English, hi, and American, what's up? Been to Warren's then? asks Joe. Warren's is one of the many pasty shops in town. Bill swallows, looks at the pasty and laughs. Correct. You should be a detective. How did you guess? Bill is a bit breathless. He's always a bit breathless, being on the large side of Massive, but if you will insist on eating a Cornish pasty first thing in the morning... Joe taps his nose. It's all in the crimping, he says. It's not. He saw Bill's assistant coming out of there half an hour ago. Bill puts down the pasty and wipes his mouth. It's flaky pastry, and there are flakes everywhere. I take it you've seen the photo of Donna and Jack, he says. Any comment, detective? No comment, says Joe. Best not to overthink it, Bill. Bill pushes on. He's sniffing out a juicy story, and he's not going to let Joe mask the scent. Jack's been around for a couple of weeks, apparently, but kept it low-key. Sailed straight into Newlyn, I heard. Bill Bolitho's boat brought him in, says Joe. No flies on you. Is that why the harbour and every other cove and inlet in West Penwith was crawling with police last night? No point lying. Yep. Drugs tip off? Yep. Any joy? Joe picks up his coffee to hide his humiliated face. Bill lets out a long whistle. Big boss lady up Truro must be seriously pissed off. That amount of policing doesn't come cheap. Pissed off? She's raging. But Joe goes with... That would be a correct assumption, yes. Not to worry, my friend, because I've got a cracker of a tip for you. Because guess who? Joe cuts Bill short. He's got no time for gossip because there's something more important he wants to talk about. We'll get to that later, says Joe. First, I want you to tell me about the bullshit you printed about Donna yesterday. Joe refuses to call Donna deadly. Because as far as Joe is concerned, if you call someone a rose, 
they will bloom. And if you call them a weed, they will wither and look a bit naff. And anyway, Donna isn't deadly. Not at all. Not these days. The leopard with funny shaped spots runs across his imagination. Bill laughs. It's a nervous laugh. What? The PR article? Bill's voice is two octaves higher now. It's what she wanted, Joe. A bit of PR, that's all it was. You know Deadly. Always on the lookout for publicity. PR my ass. I'm just so... He glances at the photo again. To be honest, I don't know what I am. He does, really. He's angry as hell. I'm just so disappointed, Bill. Bill looks at his pasty. He's inspecting a juicy but steaming hot piece of meat. No harm done. Won't happen again. He takes a bite and seems to regret it, judging by the look on his face. And this bloke. Joe scans the page for the name of the journalist. Jace Clarkson? Who is he? X Fleet Street, answers Bill, before cooling his mouth down with a swig of coke. I had a spot of trouble chasing down his references, but he's a decent hack, so I'm not going to push it. Why's he here? Slower life, better surfing. The usual story for all the upcountry folk who run away. No doubt he'll go back to the old smoke after his first winter down here. They usually do. He's missing Uber Eats already, apparently. Joe closes the newspaper. Donna stares seductively at him from the page. He turns the paper over. The article is sexist, defamatory rubbish. And Clarkson is bad news. Rein him in. Bill, only a few streets away in his office on Chapel Street. Best street in England, as it's got that perfect balance of ye olde worldy charm, and yet is also just a little bit edgy. Shakes his head and sighs. There's a lot of sighing going on in Penzance concerning Donna since that photo went out yesterday. Your loyalty does you proud, mate, says Bill. But honestly, she wouldn't piss on you if you were on fire. He throws in a snort. In fact, she'd throw petrol on the flames and dance around your burning grave. You're in her book, you know that? Joe looks at the photo once more. He doesn't necessarily see the sexy woman walking out of the water, smiling into the rising sun, or the suggestive tattoo. He sees the tomboy he once knew, his best friend at school, his hero, his old confidant, back in the day, before. Joe turns over the newspaper a final time, while Bill moves on to natter about his latest big catch. Some sort of steroid-fed sea bass. It'll be bullshit. Bill's never been a great angler. And glances longingly out of the dirty window, past the harbour and out across Mounts Bay, and wonders if Donna can truly pull off being a private detective. After all, and as Joe knows more than most, she will have to understand why the most ordinary people do the most batshit crazy things. He shakes his head in bemused wonder. Even now, after years on the force, Joe still can't work people out. He decided quite some time ago that all humanity is just nuts. But then, he thinks with a smile, with Bill still waffling on about some night fishing he's planned off the headland at St. Ives, that maybe, just maybe, the one person in Penzance who might fathom everyone out is Donna Nightshade. Joe smiles again, as he always does at the thought of her, and is suddenly overcome with a feeling that everything will probably be all right. And just as a ray of sunshine forces its way through the windows and forms a halo above the other picture of Donna sitting on his desk, Joe's mind is once again filled with doubt and jealousy and fear. Oh, and regret. It's complicated. Anyway, Bill, must get on.
Joe returns his attention to the croissant. I've a cold coffee to drink, a drugs ring on the loose and an inbox full of crap. But we haven't even talked about the reason I rang. About Deadly and Jack Crowless. You must be gutted he's back. Any statement, detective? Joe finally takes a bite of his croissant. Bill can wait. He swallows. If Donna wants to have a drink with a relation, it has nothing to do with me. Have a drink? But that's what I wanted to tell you. The whole pub heard her have threatened to kill him, man. Joe picks up his phone. It's time to swipe Bill away. What else do you know, Bill? Because I really must... Rumours. Joe takes a sip of his coffee. He gleaned it for free from Skinny Pete, a man familiar with the wrong side of the law, until Joe offered him a sturdy bridge across which to clamber his way back over to the right side. He now runs a coffee shop out of a converted horse box on the promenade. There are times still when the hint of manure hits the lips. Rumours? Come back to me when you got something more concrete. They're decent ones, so hear me out. Joe leans back in his chair. He must get around to adjusting it properly. Go on. Some say he's back for good. Jack is, and that he's planning on getting a gang back together. It won't last. You say that, but he's moved into his mother's old place. In Newlyn? It's not fit for man or beast. So it'll suit him just fine, actually. But Joe, he's planning on taking over at Penberth. Been telling people that it's his rightful family home. Joe's body tenses. He tries to relax by twisting his neck and wobbling his jaw. The whole thing's got people talking. Remembering. Remembering what? asked Joe, although he knows perfectly well. The reign of terror. It's like... Voldemort's come home and he's rounding up his Death Eaters and there's word going around that your Donna is one of them. Donna? A Death Eater? Nah. You've seen the photo? It was taken last night. They look very cosy. You just said that she threatened to kill him. You don't cosy up to someone you're going to kill. It's nothing, Bill. Tell them these people, to keep their imaginations in check. Jack Crowless is a has-been, and if he even thinks about stepping a toe out of line this time, I'll have him in cuffs quicker than you can say... Well, I'm not sure what, but anyway, if there's nothing... Jace Clarkson says he's seen Jack down Penberth way, and... Jace Clarkson is a player. You've never even met the man. I don't need to. Anyone who is referred to by both their names, forename and surname, in general conversation is always an arsehole. Jack Crowless, Jace Clarkson, Bill Smiley, he thinks but doesn't say. They're all chipped from the same block, trust me. That's as may be, but Jace Clarkson... Jace, Bill corrects himself, has been sniffing around down that neck of the woods and... What neck of the woods? Penberth, the Morana Cove. Basically the whole of West Penwith. Donna's patch. And he's coming up with some interesting stuff. You ought to speak to him. He's just trying to suck up to you. Trying to prove himself, yes. Bill begins to speak in a whisper. And yes, he's an annoying little shit. But if Jack is up to his old tricks again... What? Drugs? Smuggling? And the rest? And if it's kids that he starts recruiting, like last time? Joe takes another bite of his croissant. You make him sound like Fagin. Fagin? He's worse than any Fagin. But get this. Word is, there's somebody out to get him. Proper out for him, too. He's rattled. Jace has made inroads with one of his old gang in Newlyn. And word is that Jack is scared. He's been getting threatening notes. 
What kind of notes? Plain, old-fashioned notes. Paper ones. Delivered to the door. Joe sighs. Listen, Bill. No one sends notes anymore. They WhatsApp. And also, Jack Crowless. Scared. Joe can't see it. If someone's out to get him, it won't be a local man. More likely some oligarch gang leader who Jack double-crossed while he's been away. Anyway, let's hope somebody does wipe him out. That man is not welcome on my manor. Or, for that matter, on Donna's. Joe's mind flashes back 20 years to an image of Donna's tanned, happy face staring up at him. To a time when they were just a couple of 16-year-old kids sailing in Mounts Bay, laughing and playing, promising each other the world, like Bing Crosby and Grace Kelly in high society, but without all the singing on Joe's part, although Donna was always singing away. Oh, he remembered that one time. It was so funny when she... Anyway, I can see you're busy, says Bill. So I'll leave you to it. Are you going to the Minac tonight? What for? What for? To see Donna's new play. Or are you still in her bad books? Joe laughs. It's a soft, uncertain laugh. He shakes his head. Bad books? I don't think Donna would mind if I pitched up in plain clothes and sat at the back. She wouldn't even notice I was there. It's the uniform and the siren she can't stand. Bill snorts. Then think again, shipmate. You sent her to prison, remember? I didn't send her to prison, Bill. A judge did that. I just arrested her. It's as good as. But look at her now. You did her a favour, Joe. That was the idea. Does Deadly see it that way? She's called Donna, and I have no idea. So anyway, if that's all, I'm covering it for the paper. What? The play at the Minac. You know she wrote it herself. He didn't, but he's not surprised. It's a closed room, murder mystery in a country house type thing. Sounds bonkers to me, but knowing deadly, uh, Donna, sorry, it'll be a good crack. Something about a dead dog. A dead dog? This piques Joe's interest. Donna lost her own dog several years ago. It was a gorgeous little thing. The moment Donna lost that dog, everything changed. She went completely feral. It marked the moment that Donna Nightshade went to the bad, and she had never owned a dog since. A bloody parrot, yes, but a dog? No. But then, the poor animal had died in such a tragic... I don't suppose you know what happens to the dog? Asks Joe. In the play. Bill opens his desk drawer. Just a minute, I've got the flyer with a blurb on somewhere in here. Ah, here we go. Celebrated crime writer Mimi Fox has had one rule her entire writing career. To never kill a dog in a story because her readers would simply not accept it. Then, one day, in a cruel quirk of fate, her own dog is murdered and Mimi, taking on the investigation, becomes entwined in a murder mystery that will outstrip anything she has ever imagined before. Shame you're not coming. She's got loads of pyrotechnics in it too. Joe smiles. It's a loving smile. Of course she has. It's a nightshade production. It's bound to be wild. Why do you still look out for Donner after all these years? Bill's voice is softer now. Joe can tell it's an off-the-record type of a question. But it's not one he'll ever answer, not with the absolute truth, if there is such a thing. And Joe is beginning to believe that there isn't. Joe stands without answering, the coffee long forgotten. He grabs his jacket off the back of the chair to indicate that the conversation is over. I just do, he says. Out of interest? says Bill. What do people call me when they talk about me? Call you? You know, just plain Bill or... Ah, oh, poor Bill. 
He's taken Joe's comment to heart. Don't worry. You're just plain old Bill, he lies, throwing on his jacket. What about me? Bill starts to fiddle with the cat's cradle. You? he asks. Well, you're Joe Ennis, the copper. Always have been. Joe pauses, his jacket half on, half off. Joe Ennis. Both names, not just Joe. Bill looks into the phone and shrugs. But everyone thinks the world of you, mate, obviously. That's enough. Joe does what he should have done ten minutes ago and swipes Bill away. The screen goes black. His desk sergeant, Demelza Braithwaite, Late twenties, blonde, nice woman. Incomer, despite the name. Parents originally from Yorkshire, but were obsessed with the Poldark books, so they gave their only daughter a Cornish name and moved to Mousehole when she was little. Which is a good job, as they'd never be able to afford to buy a house there now. Grabs his attention from the outer office. Note for you, boss, she says, rushing over and handing him an envelope. Thought you'd want to look at it straight away. Sir, if you search a certain animal at the Minak Theatre on the opening night of the Nightshade play, after the play, that is most important, you will find a significant stash of cocaine on that person. Or drugs of some description. Can't say more. Anon. Joe can't help but laugh. How did it arrive? You won't believe it. Try me. By pigeon, or possibly parrot, straight into the lap of PC Trago. Here, at the station? Yes, he was having a sneaky ciggy in the yard. Joe stuffs the note in his pocket and heads out into the sunshine. He's got a ticket for a show to buy, after all. Chapter 6 Donna It's three in the afternoon and I'm at the Minak Theatre, a magnificent amphitheatre overlooking the Atlantic Ocean just around the coast from Penberth. Ruby is on my shoulder and she's shivering. I told her not to come, but she suffers terribly from FOMO, so what can you do? Today is one of those September days where the weather is trying to fool itself into believing that it's still summer, but the breeze, eager to crack on with denuding the trees, knows otherwise. My jean-covered backside is perched on a stone seat at the front of the amphitheatre. The ocean is the main player on our stage. Or behind our stage, more precisely. And I'm taking a moment to stare across Porthcurno Beach towards Logan Rock, beyond Porthcurno Beach, and have a think. I take a bobble out of my jeans pocket and pull my hair into a knot before cocking my head into the wind to blow all the anxiety away. Far, far away. Why do we let others affect us so? It's a silly habit, really, considering we're all so transient. Nothing, absolutely nothing I do in life will be of concern to anyone in years to come. So why do I get so bogged down with mundanity when I'm clearly so insignificant? Basically, why do I care? It's a rhetorical question because I know what the answer is. It's because of love. That's why we care. It's thanks to love that all the nice people in the world become vulnerable to the machinations and general dickaboutery of others. Others who love less, others who think less, others who care less. The more we love, the more we experience hurt. And it's best, I find, not to love too much at all. Also, at a grassroots level, the more I love, the more others will suffer now that Jack is back. It's his weird thing with me, which is why I have a very small and very select group of friends. Talking of friends, they will all be here in a minute, the players. It's the final dress rehearsal for Sleeping Dogs Lie, my latest crime thriller, which is a tongue-in-cheek parody with shockingly sinister overtones. Sleeping Dogs Lie is scheduled for a one-night-only performance in a few hours' time here at the Minac. The stage manager is an old schoolmate. 
and the doors open at seven. I began to write plays while serving at Her Majesty's Pleasure a few years ago. Adapt and overcome, as they say. Lamorna is here too. She's been behaving oddly all day and has taken to carrying a cutlass around with her. We have lots of interesting antique weaponry hanging on the walls at Penberth. When I asked her why, she said, Oh, no reason. I suppose, if anything, it's because it's the right accessory for my outfit today. Right now, she's playing the violin, which is why I can hear her rather than see her, as she's sitting in the orchestra pit, which is a sturdy tent that's a permanent fixture stage right. The violin is connected to an amplifier, and at the moment she's playing the frenetic masterpiece, Summer Presto. The sound is incredible. I imagine her hair as wildfire as she dips and sways to the music. Musician and bow will be moving in unison to the energy and confusion of the piece. No one can arrange music like my sister. Except, perhaps, Uncle Jago, who taught her everything she knows. Fact is, I'm confused, and Lamorna knows it. Hence the music. She knows I'm wondering what to do about Jack and she's trying to give me strength. It's working. About Jack. Jack Crowless is Auntie Donna's husband. They met when she was 19. Auntie Donna is 23 years older than me. She's in prison for attempted murder. Of Jack, who else? And for losing her marbles. It's one of those friendlier types of prison for the certifiably insane so it's not too bad. In Jack's eyes, Penberth and all that goes with it should have gone to him when his wife went gaga and tried to slit his throat. To be perfectly accurate, she tried to slit his throat before she went certifiably gaga. But thanks to the very first Belladonna Nightshade, who kicked quite a bit of pantaloon-covered ass in her day, the estate is handed down the female line if the present incumbent dies or is declared unfit to rule the roost, a.k.a. goes mad. She was so ahead of her time, the original deadly. Except that isn't the end of the story. Not for Jack. I took to the helm when my mother died in childbirth, which is coincidentally when Auntie Donna tried to kill him, and he continued to lord it around like he owned the place, and owned me. Two. Subsequently, in my late teens, my life was a mess. He ruled me. He wrecked me. And then, finally, after one dodgy deal too far, he threw me under the proverbial bus and legged it. I took some of the rap for the whole kit and caboodle of his dodgy affairs, mainly smuggling, and he got away free. I thought he'd legged it forever, but now he's back and wants to be lord of the manor. Over my dead body. God only knows what delights Auntie Donna saw in him back along. Maybe she was bonkers even then. My meeting with Jack at the Star last night was short. I have been given three tasks. One, I'm to find the man, or woman, I suggested, which was met with mirth, who's after him, because someone has been sending him threatening notes, apparently. Two, I'm to hand Penberth back into his steel claw grasp by Christmas. Dream on. Three, I'm to meet a man called Eolus Jones, which is the oddest blending of Greek and Welsh I ever saw at Porth Levin Harbour in a few days' time to arrange some kind of dodgy drop at Penberth. A drop of what? I have no idea. But it won't be a crate of rainbow-shitting unicorns, that's for sure. I don't want to do it. I'm clean as a whistle now. Almost. Four? Four? I thought it was three. My mistake. I'm to provide him with a watertight alibi for 7pm tonight because he's got a job on. That's it. Those are my tasks. Just like the old days. I said no to him once before, of course. I called his bluff. It was a mistake.
massive. And I now have a hole in my heart, the shape of a dog. Jack Crowless is a nasty man, and he is very definitely the sort of psychopath who follows through on his promises. But what to do? Ruby nuzzles into my neck while Lamorna reaches her Vivaldi crescendo. The wind is gaining momentum. I look towards Logan Rock and take a very deep breath. It must end, this living in fear of a bully who manipulates me through tapping into my weakness. Love. The music stops. Lamorna appears from the music tent, cutlass in hand. She crosses the stage and takes a perch on a stone seat behind me. She's wearing baggy yoga trousers, flip-flops, and a jumper that has a winking fox on the front. So much for the matching cutlass. I feel her arms wrap tightly around my shoulders. Time for action? She asks. I kiss her arm. Time for action, I say. Ruby circles overhead and we sit in silence waiting for the players to arrive. Chapter 7 Donna The first to arrive for rehearsal is Skinny Pete. He's 40-ish, and despite the drug abuse of previous years and the occasional bit of pot after an evening surf, oh, and the magic mushrooms he sprinkles into his savoury croissants now and again, special customers only, he's wearing well. Pete isn't that skinny anymore, or really called Pete. He picked up that tag because at his skinniest, he looked exactly like the actor who played Skinny Pete in Breaking Bad, especially when he was wearing his trademark woolen hat, as he is now. No one ever auditions for a part in one of my plays. It's a closed theatre group, and I write specific parts tailored to each player's strengths and deliver the scripts a few weeks before. Secrecy is vital. In Sleeping Dogs Lie, Skinny Pete is playing an ex-drug user turned good who owns a coffee van on the promenade in Penzance. Okay, so there is a blatant element of the based on a true story about this play. Pete usually plays the guy everyone expects to have committed the crime slash murder slash theft, but hasn't. And that's based purely on the fact that he has the wiry look of a psychotic villain about him. And that kind of preconceived opinionizing is hard to shake. So I don't shake it, as a rule. I use it to my advantage. There was this one play where Pete really was the murderer, the ending of which absolutely no one saw coming. And the fact that no one guessed Pete was the murderer gobsmacked me because, come on, The play was called When Skinny Got Fat, and the dead man was called Fat Justin. I was going for obvious but sardonic comic elegance in that play, but the audience thought that Pete couldn't possibly be the murderer because it was just too obvious to be true. Rather than applaud my beautiful simplicity, the audience were annoyed by the obviousness of it. They felt duped, which is kind of the point with that kind of thing, surely. I explained that I had wanted to create not so much a who done it, but a why done it, and hoped to show the complex and yet simple workings inside the mind of a murderer and how it could transpire that someone, Skinny Pete, could be pushed to commit the ultimate crime and yet be forgiven for it. And I had hoped to do all this by writing a thought-provoking play of masterly craftswomanship. But nobody gave two shits about the inner workings of the murderer's mind or the craftswomanship. They just wanted to be led down numerous garden paths until, right at the end, the gates to the truth, big iron ones, preferably gothic, opened to reveal the identity of the murderer with either a, well, I never, surprise gasp, or a, hello, I guess that five minutes in. But... The gates never opened. It was Skinny Pete who did it, just like I said it was in the title. The end. It didn't review well. 
Skinny Pete's long legs descend the steep stone steps of the amphitheatre with the awkwardness of an unsteady baby gazelle who has decided to have a go at walking down an up escalator. We fist bump, but the greeting seems half-hearted on Pete's behalf. What's on? I say. What's on? He doesn't stop to chat, but carries on walking in the direction of a wooden cabin that is the performer's changing room. Pete isn't the sort of guy who believes in conversation for conversation's sake, and a fist bump says much more than words could ever convey. But still, there are fist bumps and fist bumps. I let it go. The next of my players starts slinking her way silently down the steps. Cat. Cat is not proper Cornish, but somehow she kind of edged her way into the group via the local vicar, who found her homeless and penniless one night in the middle aisle at Little. She told us that she earned her name over the course of her childhood because her mother would often lock her out at night, which led to her roaming the streets or else slinking into a neighbour's home, drinking their milk and curling up to sleep on their sofa. I have no idea what her real first name is, She's never seemed to want to divulge it, but things are on the up for Cat these days. She has a home, an old fisherman's hut of ours overlooking the cobbles at Penberth Cove, which is so London chic, and a job working the night shift at Little. She was hanging out there anyway, so, as I said to the manager, she might as well be earning money while she roams. It's surprising, then, that Cat has a face like thunder today. Yes, she's more than a bit rough round the edges in manners and grace, but her chin-length blonde hair looks like ratchet, which is not like Cat, who usually nails the just-got-out-of-bed-but-still-rocking-the-beach-wave look. All right, bird, says Cat with a sniff. She's talking to me, not Ruby. Bird is what Cornish women sometimes call each other, and cats adopted the local patois. All right. You, all right? I ask, while throwing in a microscopic eyebrow raise. The left one, obviously. Cat shrugs. Yeah, all right. Is Pete here? Why? Cat throws me a nasty glance. That's new. Why do you always think everything is your business, Donna? she says. Anyway, it's going to take long. Only I've got somewhere I need to be before my shift starts. I want to say you can't rush genius, but go with. I'm waiting for Gabby and Jago to arrive and then we'll crack on. Cat slinks towards the dressing room. I call after her. I've got a flower delivery in Newlyn this afternoon, I say. I could meet you for a coffee later. Nah, you're all right. She shouts, still walking. Well, that's me kissed off. As Cat exits stage left, I look up to see an athletic 40-something woman leaping down the amphitheatre steps, two at a time, while ripping off a dog collar. She jumps onto the stage. It's Gabrielle. Gabby. Jones. The vicar. The one who introduced me to Cat. I came across Gabby during my spell as a prison inmate a few years ago. Gabby popped in once a week to offer spiritual guidance, along with the occasional cigarette. She plays a mean game of poker, too. Gabby said that on first noticing me across the prison exercise yard, she stopped in her tracks because a nimbus, an actual nimbus, hovered gloriously above my head in a perfect glowing circle. And she was sober when she told me, so... It must be true. From that point on, Gabby refused to believe that I was anything other than an angel, even if I was banged up for smuggling, aiding a drug dealer, and a touch of knife crime. It was a turning point for me, though, no question. When someone believes in you, truly believes, it can spark the beginning of believing in yourself. After all, call someone a rose and it will bloom, etc. Anyhow, we kept in touch, and after I was released, Gabby pitched up out of the blue at my manor. That sounds like I'm a cockney villain, but I mean my actual manor house, Penberth. 
saying that she was desperate for a change. As luck would have it, the vicarship, is that a word? At the little church at Penberth had just become vacant. Uncle Jago spoke to a couple of old boys he knew from his days of sitting in the House of Lords. He doesn't bother with that archaic, mind-bogglingly stupid and elitist nonsense anymore. But nevertheless, still managed to wangle it with an archbishop. He had dirt on him, I believe, for Gabby to get the gig at Penberth Church and live at the vicarage permanently. I invited Gabby to join the players after her first Harvest Festival, and she has been ensconced within the fold of the Nightshade Players ever since. What's on? I say. What's on? She replies. Final rehearsal, then, she states. Not that I need or want reminding. She nods in the direction of the music tent. Lamorna sounds better than ever. Lamorna has seamlessly transitioned from I Can't Make You Love Me to Gabby's favourite hymn, Lord of the Dance, which is Gabby's go-to uplifting hymn on a Sunday. Gabby always becomes particularly animated when reaching the line, I danced on a Friday when the world turned black. It's hard to dance with the devil on your back. I've always had an inkling that there's a darker side to Gabby, which only adds to her appeal, frankly. I can't believe it's come around so quickly, she says. Everyone here? Two missing, I say. Gabby rolls up her dog collar and places it into her trouser pocket. The captain and Carenza? Wasn't that a pop duo in the 70s? I joke. Gabby shrugs. She'd normally laugh at my daft quips. Climate change protest, I explain. Carenza has set up a netted compound in the car park at Sainsbury's. She's encouraging people to take all the plastic off their shopping as they exit the store and dump it in the compound. Then she's going to leave the whole lot for Sainsbury's to sort out. That's not like her. She's usually so... demure. I know. The world's gone mad. Much media interest? Tons. I take my iPhone out of my back pocket and scroll through Twitter. She's just tweeted to say the BBC are there and that hashtag stick your plastic up your ass is trending on Twitter. And Uncle Jago? Down in a minute, I should think. He'll be distracted by his new pigs. Gabby's head drops. Not new ones. I thought he said never again when the last batch got trailered away. It was awful. They squealed like they were being taken away from their mother. Which they were. I say. Gabby signs a cross over her heart. It's tragic, I agree, but he just can't resist the lure of the piglet, poor old soul. He knows the rules, though. No pets at Pemberth. If he flattens them, he flattens them. That's the rule. Gabby glances up the amphitheatre steps to see a flash of red winging its way towards us. Except for Ruby, she says. Except for Ruby, although Ruby isn't a pet. She's more of an employee. Ruby turns with a hairpin swish and lands on my shoulder. My phone pings and I see two text messages from Uncle Jago. The first reads, Down directly. Late out of bed due to lock-in at the Admiral. Also, need to feed the piglets. I look up at Gabby. Yep. He's with the pigs. The second text is also from Jago and is a little less bland. Intruder alert! A damn journo has just pitched up. Annoying asshole. Says his name is Jace and that you're expecting him. Wants to do an early review to drum up business. Don't trust him. His eyes are too close together. Sent him down to you. The long way. Blunderbuss at the ready. P.S. Tell the others I stink of pig shit. Everything all right? Asks Gabby. Perfect, I say. Except, I pause. He's back, Gabby. Who is? JC. Gabby pirouettes on the stage. 
Oh, I always knew he'd come back. I just knew it. Two billion Christians couldn't be wrong. Oh, Donna, everything will be okay now. Just you wait and see. The oceans, the climate, my hair. I see the misunderstanding and throw my arms around my friend. Sorry, my lovely, I meant my Uncle Jack. Jack Crowless. But the real JC will pitch up one day, I'm sure of it. I'm not. Gabby's expression is flat. There is no expression. I met him at the star last night, I say. You met him? I had no choice. He thinks someone's out to get him. And to be honest, with any luck, they will. Someone's been pestering him with threatening notes. But whoever it is, I pity them. Because when Jack finds out, and he will find out, that's for sure, he'll bloody kill them. The door to the dressing room clicks open. Pete and Kat spill out, faces like thunder, dressed for the show. Gabby grabs my arm. I'm worried, she says. For me? Don't be. I pick up the script from a seat on the front row. I can't do anything about him until this play is done and dusted, but I'll sort it all out after that, once and for all. He won't get the better of me this time, Gabby. No way. Lamorna kicks into the final chorus, and Uncle Jago appears, all puffed out, carrying a blunderbuss and smelling of pig poo. All will be well, he says, guessing the mood and patting me on the head. This time, all will be well. I really hope so, Uncle, I say. I really do hope so. Chapter 8 It was 2am earlier that morning when Jack's stubby fingers fumbled to get the key in the door of his terraced cottage in the centre of the harbour village of Newlyn. The cottage is of the two-up-two-down cobbled street variety, which is the type of house that, once upon a time, had a genuine fisherman living inside and reeked of blood, sweat and gutted herring. Not so much anymore. The Cornish coast is littered with these houses, but they are now the bolt holes of second homeowners, known locally as Londoners, and have the faint waft of a bergamot and geranium candle drifting out of a cracked window into the street, but only when the plantation shutters are open. Jack's house isn't like that. It's a shithole. He dropped the key on the pavement, picked it up, glanced down the dimly lit street, then finally turned the key before darting into the house and locking, and bolting, the crumbling door behind him. He dropped to his haunches with his back to the door and tried to still his shaking hands while wondering how on earth he had survived the horror show that had just unfurled on Logan Rock. He was right after all. Someone really was after him. He didn't get a proper look at the face, what with the swinging torch from the iPhone. But surely it must have been someone drenched to the bone in evil up on that rock, like a mangy kitten taunting a defenceless mouse. He should never have believed that cock and bull story from the nightshade girl in the pub about the priceless ruby and the offer of sex. He'd let himself slip, let his guard down for a bit of skirt. He'd have to watch that. Was it one of the new gang up on that rock? Possibly. But why? No. It was most likely some link to Lithuania. Maybe that Russian cartel he duped. He needed to think. And to strip himself of his dripping wet clothes. There was a bread oven in the recess of the Inglenook fireplace that Jack used as a safe. He took out an envelope, which was full of handwritten notes. Sets of numbers were written on the notes, written to look like code, but he knew what they represented. He darted upstairs, knowing that he would find a well-thumbed Bible in a bedside drawer. A Bible that he had been forced to learn as a child while being smacked with a cane if he quoted it wrongly by his mother. About Jack. Jack's mum had a dog when she was younger, and the bitch had got caught by the local shagabout town mongrel, 
leaving Jack's mum lumbered with a litter of puppies. The dog accepted all the puppies onto her teats, except one, whom she kept abandoning behind the bins in the backyard. Jack's mum had felt sorry for the abandoned puppy, and so trickled cow's milk down its throat until it grew strong. Eventually, the same pup turned around and bit Jack's mum on the arse, and subsequently bit everyone else's arse on the street. And it dawned on Jack's mum that the bitch mother had known instinctively that this dog was a bad pup. It was ironic, therefore, that she felt the same about her own pup, Jack. He was a bad un, and she'd known it from the minute he had been untimely ripped. Only it was against the law to leave a human pup behind the bins, so she fed him anyway, not with mother's milk, but with the Bible. It didn't help. Bible in hand, he ran down the stairs, closed the tatty curtains as well as he could, as they weren't exactly hanging well, and after stripping off his clothes down to his unflattering Y-front underpants, he kicked his way across the detritus of old pizza boxes, plastic curry containers and beer bottles, flopped down on a threadbare sagging sofa and, still shaking with cold and fear, took a note out of the envelope at random. H922. H. That must mean the epistle to the Hebrews. But which passage? He flicked through the pages of the New Testament with wild fingers until he found chapter 9, verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. His nostrils started to flare. How dare they play him at his own game? His mother's Bible was littered with folded corners marking her favourite passages, which were usually the fiery ones quoted to him throughout his childhood. He flicked through them for inspiration, and with a rush of blood and confidence, he scrambled to the door, and after faffing for a moment with the key and the bolt, his eyesight and coordination not being quite what they should be tonight. He flung the door open and yelled, But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him, which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Fear him. With his rocking horse nostrils now flaring and his inflated biceps burning, he continued to yell, And I shall be revenged, do you hear? Revenged. A dog barked his annoyance on the next street, and Jack tottered back inside in his underpants, leaving the door wide open this time. He selected another number, and with a rush of blood to the brain, fired out a text. Get me that dog suit. We're on. Chapter 9 As clandestine venues for an illegal drop go, the Middle Isle at Little seems like an unlikely place. But it is in exactly the most benign, unlikely places that the most successful clandestine drops tend to happen. As is the case at Little where the workers are simply too easygoing to give two shits about what anyone else might be up to. Which is why one person, Pete, it's skinny Pete, is rooting around with his ass in the air, deep inside a large dumper basket of fleecy slippers, looking for a pair of size sevens. Which is odd, as Pete is a UK size ten. To his left is a large stack of inflatable jacuzzis, when it's gone, it's gone. And to his right is a pile of baking appliances like the ones used in Bake Off, which have been selling like, well, hotcakes. He has been told to stuff a package inside a size seven slipper, the left one. With shaking hands, he takes a last glance up and down the aisle, slips a small padded envelope out of his jacket pocket and stuffs it in the slipper. He looks up and is surprised to see a familiar face handing money over to a furtive-looking store manager by the door. The store manager hands over a naked mannequin, which is subsequently tucked awkwardly under the woman's arm. 
Ask no questions, Pete. You've got your own shit to worry about, he thinks, before legging it out of little with an inflatable jacuzzi under one arm and a bottle of cider under the other. Chapter 10 Donna The rehearsal went just about as badly as it's possible for a last rehearsal to go. And now, just a few hours later, it's here. The moment of the actual performance. I feel sick. This is the stuff that naked dreams are made of. Even so, the sun has set and the theatre is cosseted in a subtle orange glow. The sea, the perfect backdrop, is behaving herself and looking truly fantastic, all dressed up in her best bib and tucker. I wish I could say the same for the rest of the cast. I look through a crack in the dressing room door as the first members of the audience find their seats. Uncle Jago was weird during the rehearsal and was distracted to the extent of fluffing his part, which is a difficult thing to do considering that all he has to do is don a dog suit and perform a non-speaking walk-on role that lasts for about a minute. All but Lamorna seemed edgy, and Carenza didn't even pitch up to support us, which wasn't the end of the world because she refuses to be a player, stating that life is a big enough performance without creating even more drama. Also, she's got a full schedule of online yoga classes on Zoom with clients in Australia tonight, which I'm a bit disappointed about because, come on, she's my auntie, and who wouldn't cancel everything to see a Donna Nightshade production? Not Carenza, obviously. All I can hope, as we approach Curtain Up, is that the encouraging pep talk I gave the players earlier... That was absolute crap! Get a grip, you bunch of absolute wastrels! has brought them all up to snuff. Lamorna is in the orchestra tent and is playing Cornish folk songs on the harp to settle the audience. Before the show starts, she will play Trelawney, which is the Cornish anthem. Anyone who's anyone sings along to Trelawney. I feel a sudden sense of calm when I see her silhouette backlit by the tent lantern lights, her arms running up and down the strings like she's tickling a trout. My sister is with me, my uncle is with me, and all will be well. The theatre is full, which is just bloody typical as we've never managed a full house before, not even close. Deep in my soul, I was hoping that a storm would blow in and Poseidon would appear with his mighty fork. Is it a fork? Which would mean that sadly, with much regret, we would have to cancel the show. Full refunds and so on. But no, the stubborn sea and sky have refused to make more of the previous swell and one way or another, the show will go on. Which is why, dressed as an angel, an avenging angel, to be completely accurate, with outlandishly large wings spreading out from my shoulders and a nimbus above my head, I'm the narrator. It makes sense, eventually. I nod towards my mate from school, Louise Thomas, the stage manager for the Minac, who's watching from the lighting control balcony. And on cue, she dulls the lighting and the audience quietens. I feel sick. Chapter 11 The first person in the audience I clap eyes on as I step out onto the stage is Joe Ennis. He's the copper who sent me to prison many years ago. That roguish hack, Bill Smiley, is sitting to one side of him and another copper, Demelza, is sitting to his left. Joe must think I'm smiling at him personally as if, because he's smiling back like it's 2002. I puff out my wings and begin my narration, just as a giant dog comes bounding down the steps from the top of the amphitheatre, weaving his way through the audience. It's Uncle Jago's moment of glory. Right on cue, the dog collapses into his kennel, having been brutally murdered in a way that would make most Greek tragedies look tame, and I close the door on the kennel a large bolster wood affair, moving on to open the play in a way that, I admit, may have been adapted slightly from Shakespeare. 
in fair Penzance, where we find our scene, an old wound spurts forth from new, and ancient ties and grievances make beautiful minds bend crooked, and death's dagger blade is unseen. Two hours later, and it's all gone off surprisingly well. The audience has been in stitches, sometimes intentionally, but mostly not. Hey-ho, a laugh's a laugh. In between my narrator slots, I couldn't help but stand in the wings and watch Joe. I admit it was pleasant to see his face lit by the glow of the stage, but it also seemed lit from within by something else too. Could it be the glow of happiness? Has he fallen in love again? With Demelza? No. Or is he just a bit hot under the collar? There's no time to ponder, because fireworks complete, it's time for the rug-pulling showstopper finale. Skinny Pete rips open the kennel door to free the dog, who is now an angel. It's symbolic, which is the cue for Jago to come running out wearing a halo and skip around the stage before disappearing up the steps through the audience to heaven. I can't see inside the kennel from where I'm standing, but no dog has come running out, and when Pete improvises to glance inside the kennel, he steps back with a hand to his mouth. A woman's scream is the only sound that rings out through the theatre, and it's a sound that represents perfectly the faces of a gobsmacked audience. A wave of fear rises within me. Jago. I cross the stage and look inside. A dog is indeed dead on the floor. There is a knife in his neck, which is a new twist that is not in any of my actor notes, so I'm guessing that this is no play acting. Blood is splattered on the kennel walls and has pulled across the floor, which is a great visual aid to the drama but Louise isn't going to be happy with me because it'll be a nightmare to scrub off. My immediate reaction is relief. Happiness, even. Because it's not Jago in the dog suit at all. It's Jack Crowless, and he's lying on the kennel floor exactly like a dead human, rather than like a dead dog, which, from a production point of view, is disappointing. By the colour of his face, I'd say he's definitely dead especially given that the dog collar is wrapped so tightly around his neck that his face is cobalt blue. Although, that could be the theatre lights. But the knife in his neck kind of seals the deal on the murder front. A child's toy is lying on top of him. It's Thomas the Tank Engine. Shit. A million questions rush to mind, but there's no time for answers now, because I've an audience staring on in horror, a vicar who is crouching next to the body while wailing, and a reputation as a playwright and production manager that needs to be managed. I smile, close the door of the kennel, and nod up to Louise again, whose mouth is gaping, to indicate the need to throw on the big lights, or at least turn off the blue ones. I grab Pete's hand just as Joe Ennis starts making his way to the stage. That's all I need. The newspaper hack looks like he's orgasmic and takes out his notebook, while Demelza looks on like it's the best day of her life and has taken out her phone. The other players are waiting in the wings, unsure as to what's going on. I hold out my hands and encourage them onto the stage, smiling. Lamorna, who has completed her finale ensemble of Lord of the Dance, stands by the door of the music tent, waiting to be invited onto the stage. As we all join hands and begin to bow, someone high up in the gods begins to slow clap. It's Jace Clarkson. I hear sarcasm in the resonance of his clapping, but it doesn't matter because, completely hoodwinked and more than a little confused, The rest of the audience is beginning to laugh and clap also. A slow clap of relief with growing momentum. We all turn, as rehearsed, towards the music tent, which is when Lamorna steps out to the loudest applause of all. I've never seen her look so happy. 
With our final bow complete, the audience begins to disperse. My eyes meet Joe's. He doesn't look so radiant anymore. The only word to describe his expression as he crosses the stage towards me is sad. He opens the kennel door and steps inside. I hear a siren in the distance. Here we go again. Chapter 12 Donna I'm sitting in the dark in a seat in the gods at the top of the amphitheatre, wrapped in a foil blanket, watching on as the scene continues to unfold on stage. I'm no longer the main player in this production, but just another spellbound member of the audience. The rest of the gang are all in the dressing room being supervised, guarded by a female officer while waiting to be questioned. Cat is chain-smoking Benson and Hedges, and Pete looks like a startled rabbit in headlights. As for Gabby, she's gone to pieces entirely. So much for pastoral care in times of crisis. I've already been questioned, and by Demelza rather than Joe, which miffed me a bit because surely I'm the main suspect. It seems that every officer serving in West Cornwall Police has descended on the theatre, which isn't very many as the force has been cut to the bone over the past few years. But no doubt social media is alive by now, with comments and zoomed-in photographs of dead Jack. Scene of crime have arrived from Truro and have erected a white tent around the kennel. Certain obvious but frankly bizarre questions remain unanswered, like why on earth had Jack Crowless, of all people, taken Jago's part in the play. Where is Jago? Was the killer out to kill Jack, or did they intend to kill Jago and Jack copped it by mistake? The biggest question of all, though, the one I just can't fathom, is how the hell was it done? I have no answers to these questions, and I told Demelza that, too. She didn't believe me. None of the policemen seem to have noticed that I'm looking on, except for Joe, who has glanced my way a couple of times, throwing me an indecipherable expression. Detective Chief Inspector Jenny Penworthy from Truro Police, nice woman, driven but nice, has just arrived. She shakes hands with Joe, and I see her do a little dance and hear her say, Ding dong, the witch is dead which I think is proper cool for a copper, but someone really ought to tell her that the whole point of an amphitheatre is that sound carries from the stage. I'm hearing a whole bunch of things that probably should be for police ears only. Someone takes a seat in the dark behind me while I'm trying to listen in. I turn around to look. It's Louise, the stage manager. What's on? She says. Was on. She nudges my shoulder. I must hand it to you, Donna. There have been quite a few murders carried out on that stage over the past few years, but this is one production that will take some beating. She jumps down a level to sit next to me. I manage a laugh and shake my head. Sorry about this, Louise, I say. That blood is going to be a right pain to shift. It's not your fault she says. The trustees won't mind because the publicity for the Minac will be brilliant. We'll probably introduce the idea of a ghost. How have the staff taken it? I ask. She shrugs. No one seems to be too fussed or surprised. I hear there's a brilliant clip on TikTok. Have the police let them all go? Yes, there's only me left from the Minac staff now, and I'll stay for the night, just to make sure they don't trash the place, if nothing else. We both quieten and watch the stage. Insignificant bits of nothing are being bagged up and labelled. Best watch yourself, though, she says, breaking the silence. Word is that you threatened to kill him at the pub. The whole town knows about that little fracas, by the way. Great. Well, yes, I did say that, but what was I supposed to say when he was trying to turn me into his bloody stooge again and topple me from Penberth? Fair enough, 
But why did you give him a part in the play? I didn't. Hmm, she says. Hmm, I confirm. You been interviewed yet? She asks. Briefly, Demelza. I don't need to turn to see the eye roll. How was she? Too nice. I smell a rat. Have you seen my uncle, by the way? Christ alone knows what's happened to him. I suppose I should look for him, really. Jago, repeats Louise. Oh, he's in the cafe. I gave him a brandy. The police have just finished interviewing him. Jago? Yes. Shit. Louise nudges my arm. I was in the back room for the whole interview, if you want to know what he told them. I do. I'm hoping he had a convincing, non-incriminating reason to explain why Jack Crowless was found dead in his dog suit after playing the part he should have been playing, although Jack did go for it particularly convincingly, to be fair. Louise pats my hand. Jago said he got a note from you saying that one of his piglets had got out and it had been seen down Nan Jizzle way, that he was to be sure to go and rescue it and not come to the Minac and that you'd pick up the suit from his study and get someone to stand in for him. A note, I say. From me? She nods. Didn't you wonder where he was in the interval? She asks. I thought you'd put a door on the back of the kennel so he could get out. We did, but he said he wanted to be left alone in there because he'd been struggling to get to grips with the real thematic significance of the Iliad and that tonight was the perfect opportunity for a bit of a read. He likes to keep up with his old Oxford scholar buddies, you see. Sounds like Jago, says Louise. Doesn't it just, I agree. Oh, I don't know. It's all getting very... Shakespearean? No, Nightshadian. Louise laughs, but like a joke at a funeral, it rings out uncomfortably around the theatre. Joe's gaze follows the direction of the laughter. Louise stands. Anyway, must get on. The coppers want some tea making. Don't sit on the cold stone too long, though, or you'll get piles. I smile up at her. She fishes a hand inside a coat pocket and takes out a set of ear pods. Here, she says. Put these in. I take the ear pods and look up, confused. The stage mic is still live, she says. We've turned off the speakers, but the earphones are still working. Stage manager's perks and all that? Louise rests a hand on my shoulder. If it helps. I'm glad he's dead, she says. We all are. Chapter 13 Donna Louise drifts away as I slip the ear pods in. The chatter is all a bit benign, so I take out my brand new Edge of the World Detective Agency notebook and a new Easy Flow pen I'd bought especially for my detective work. On the first page, I write... Things I noticed at scene of crime, SOC, before the police arrived. 1. When Pete built the kennel, he put the back panel on a latch so Uncle Jago wouldn't have to spend the whole play in there. The panel was Pete's idea. 2. When Joe hurriedly tried to release the dog collar that had seemingly strangled Jack, the collar wouldn't unfasten. A knife was called for. Joe said not to remove the one from his neck, and the collar was slit. Attached to the collar, inside, was exactly the sort of zip tie we put around tree stakes at the manor, and once those zip ties click into place, there's no unfastening them. Who had access to the collar? Three. The dog suit dead Jack is wearing is not the dog suit I gave to Uncle Jago. It's the same type, but it's different. Jax has a patch on the left eye. There are, therefore, two dog suits kicking around, and I only bought one. Not that I revealed this to the police. 
four. Perhaps the most important observation I have made, and should perhaps have been point number one, is that the knife in his neck is mine. And I can't deny it, as when they take it out, they will see that it has my name engraved on the blade. At least I know what happened to it now. Five. How did the murderer know that Jack would be in the kennel rather than Jago? Was someone trying to kill Jago? Six. There was a smell of burning after the interval. It didn't last long, but it was definitely there, and I noticed Joe Ennis with his nostrils in the air too. I'm about to write seven when I hear the DCI say, take a look at this, through the earphones. I watch Joe follow Penworthy as they walk to the back of the tent and out of view. They must be looking over the safety barrier down the sheer drop of rocks to the sea below, because she says, do you think someone could scale this without a rope? Yes, the answer to that is yes. I know someone who's done it. I'll need to have a look in the daylight and from below, says Joe, and get a rock climber in to confirm it, but I shouldn't think so. Put it this way, it's not something that could be done in a hurry or without a rope. A rope could have been tied to the barrier, says Penworthy, but how would it have been untied if the murderer left that way? Joe doesn't answer straight away, but eventually he says what everyone is thinking. It couldn't, which means the murderer never left, or it's a two-man job. They reappear. If this had been a play, there would have been far too much action off stage. Come on then, says the DCI. What do we know so far? Hit me with it. Joe clears his throat. We know that Jack Crowless ran into the kennel at the start of the show, although the man in the dog suit should have been Jago Nightshade. The box has a hinge at the back. Two hours later, at the end of the show, Jack was found dead inside the kennel, effectively strangled and stabbed. The post-mortem will clarify. Come on, Joe, you can do better than that. How do you know it was Jack who was wearing the dog suit? And how do you know it was Jack who ran into the kennel, she asks. Did you see his face? See? I'm good at this. No. Penworthy sighs. Sighing is never good from the boss. Did whoever it was that ran into the kennel have the same build as Jack? Difficult to say, given the suit and the fact that he... Or she... Come on, Joe or she, was bounding on all fours. The DCI sighs again. That's two sighs inside 20 seconds. So, continues Joe, rubbing his forehead, a man or a woman who may or may not have been Jack Crowless entered the kennel at the start of the show. Unless there's been some kind of smoke and mirrors thing going on with a dummy back panel, there was no one else in there at the time. You're certain? I was right in front of it. Not a chance. Donna closed the door on, let's call it, the dog, and we didn't see inside the kennel again until the end of the show. How convenient, says Penworthy. Almost like the play was written that way. And you're certain there couldn't have been a dummy back where the murderer could have hidden? Looking at the depth of the kennel is unlikely and to move a panel and dispose of it without the audience seeing or hearing would have been difficult. I doubt anyone could see round the back of the kennel from any of the seats, what with the Hessian screening, says Penworthy. Get a constable to check that out. I'd say that the play and kennel fit in with the mechanics of the murder quite conveniently. Who wrote it? Donna Nightshade. But to be fair, the ex-con interrupts the DCI. The reformed teenager who went a bit awry, yes, confirms Joe. Fair play, that was nice of him. Sergeant Braithwaite interviewed her and she confirmed that Jack had not been given a part in the play, so if it was Jack who ran down the steps and play-acted a dying dog at the beginning of the play, Donna has no idea how he would have known what to do or how to act it out. Or so she says. 
who should have been in the dog suit? Jago Nightshade, Donna's uncle. Isn't he a bit... eccentric? Yes. And why wasn't he in the suit himself? Joe refers to his notebook. He received a note saying that one of his pigs was missing and he went to look for it. Wait, pigs? He'd miss a play for a pig? They're like children to him. He does kill them in the end, though. Seems like it's a regular theme in the family. I take it no pig was missing. No, it was a bogus note. Convenient. If she says the word convenient again, I'll go down there and throttle her. So, continues Joe, either someone sent the note to get Jago out of the way to get their hands on the suit, basically Jack Crowless, or Jago is in on it and is lying about the note, or Jack Crowless wasn't in the suit at all and he was backstage the whole time and then went into the kennel at the end in a different dog suit. Didn't I say there are two dog suits kicking around? But then we have the problem of why on earth Jack was in a dog suit in the first place. I can't see how it was done without at least one of the cast knowing about it. Or doing it. What about the Minak staff? They were all front of house and accounted for. Donna never lets anyone backstage other than the players. Again, how very convenient. Right, that's it. The zip tie inside the collar was a neat trick, she says. But Jack was a strong fella. Let's say someone had hidden around the back, opened the latch and gone in to strangle him. He'd have put up a fight, surely. You'd have thought so. But that's when the knife could have gone in. Why go through the rigmarole of the collar if you're going to stab him anyway? Could be an elaborate suicide says Joe. Designed to frame Donna? They do have history. You're just making yourself look like a trainee copper now, Joe. Jack Crowless commits suicide? She scoffs. No way. This is murder, Joe. Plain and simple. Although maybe not that simple. Handy that you were here. I didn't see you as someone who'd watch something so naff. You can really go off a person. I was sent a note earlier, a tip-off. Joe puts on blue plastic gloves, reaches into his inside jacket pocket and takes out something that looks like a freezer bag. He removes a piece of paper and starts to read. Sir, if you search a certain animal at the Minak Theatre on the opening night of the Nightshade play, after the play, that is most important, you will find a significant stash of cocaine on that person or drugs of some description. Can't say more. Anon. How very cute, says Penworthy. Any idea who sent it? Not a clue. I take it the animal was Jack. There were no other animals in the play. And there were no drugs on him? Not a sniff. Hmm... Get forensics to check out the suit. Has the place been sniffed out? The dogs are arriving now. Penworthy disappears inside the tent. And what's with the toy train that was left on his back? She asks. How weird is that? Was it part of the play? Apparently not, says Joe. According to Donna's statement. Penworthy sighs. The whole play sounds like a completely ridiculous farce. I don't know how you sat through it. Joe laughs, but it's a kind laugh, not mocking. It wasn't ridiculous, it was nuanced. But as for the train, it's possibly a reference to the time years ago when Jack Crowless... La 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 la, I'm not listening. Jesus, evil bastard, says Penworthy once Joe has explained what happened. I wouldn't blame her for killing him. If I'd been Donna, I'd have found a way to push him off a cliff years ago. Who knew about it? Very few people. She doesn't know I know. I do now. Who told you? Her aunt. 
The nutter or the hippie? The nutter. Really? What we definitely know is this, she begins. Either Donna did it or was involved in it, or she's been set up by one of her cast who were the only people, other than an expert rock climber, who could have done it. She's right, damn her. That's my initial summation, yes, says Joe. The toy train could be Donna's calling card, she says. She's obviously the dramatic, batshit crazy type, and the weirdness of the play proves that she has the kind of imagination that could drum up an elaborate thing like this. Maybe she knows we'll catch her. Maybe she just doesn't care about going back to prison and killing him was worth it. Maybe she's the next Cornish serial killer. Penworthy sniffs. Anyway, must be off. I've got a real dog at home crossing his legs. Keep doing the legwork, Joe, and look at the interview statements. Start drawing up a hypothesis and wait for the results of the PM. She must mean post-mortem. I'll get them rushed through for you, she says. By the looks of things, your list of suspects is straightforward. I would expect you to have this cleared up quickly. She pauses to touch his arm. You sure you got this? Joe nods a little too vigorously to be convincing, like a kid persuading his mum that he's ready to walk to school on his own. She crosses the stage. And when you've caught the killer, I want you to get straight back onto finding the drug suppliers. It's coming ashore somewhere on your patch, Joe, and I'm taking all kinds of crap defending you. Latest intel suggests a link to France. I'll send you the file. And as for the murder... I'll give you four days. There's no way it should take longer than that. I'd start with the uncle. My money's on him. At least him being in on it. He was probably doing Donna's bidding, mind you. What happened to innocent before proven guilty? Well, not necessarily. Go on, Joe, tell her. Penworthy puts up a hand. Listen, Donna's got form. She hated Jack, and she had the means, the motive, and the imagination to pull it off. You put her away once, Joe. You can do it again. The woman is clearly unhinged. Occam's razor. Sometimes the most obvious solution is the right one. You said yourself that the answer would be simple. Jago will know something about the whole thing, even if he didn't do it. He must do. Some screw it out of him. No, the whole thing has Donna Nightshade's name all over it. Maybe the drug dealer you can't find is one and the same person and it's all linked. Remember the note? I reckon Donna was in cahoots with Jack with the drugs. It wouldn't be the first time. And she arranged this fiasco to finish him off to get the stash herself and get him out of the way. But the rest of the sentence must wait because a man in white overalls has taken her to one side. There's mumbling that I miss. I tap my ears in case the mics are playing up. Penworthy walks back to Joe. The knife has Donna's name on it, she says, engraved on the blade. Her what? I wondered when this would come up. Her name. Her actual name. It's engraved on the blade. Job done. Bring her in. Joe turns away and puts his hand through his hair. When he turns back, his expression is desperate. Their performance, I admit, is getting better. Just give me those four days to investigate it before I bring her in, please. She's got an ankle monitor, so she can't go anywhere. And if you knew how hard she's worked to pull it all back together again, I think she's been framed. The family business has been struggling and she's needed to diversify, but... Ha! Exactly. Please, says Joe. Fine, I'll give you four days. But my money's on her. How much money, he says, his demeanour somewhat coquettish suddenly. Penworthy takes an astonished step back. Joe's blown it now. Definitely blown it. Twenty? What the actual... F 
Make it 50 and you're on, he says. It's poor policing, but I can't help but be pleased. Joe's money is on me, which is lovely, actually. They shake hands just as another man in a white coat approaches. You're certain, she says to him. The man nods. She turns to Joe. Well, that's a turn up. The dogs have sniffed out a sports direct bag full of drugs. Where? Stuffed inside a massive rucksack backstage in the dressing room. Who's rucksack? asks Joe. Not Donna's. No, some actress called Gabrielle Jones. Never. Joe's response mirrors my own. The vicar, he splutters. Jesus. Jesus? I don't care if she's the Archbishop of bloody Canterbury. Bring her in. Penworthy turns away while throwing one last dynamite piece of information his way. Oh, and they found traces of cocaine on the inside of Jack's dog suit. Penworthy claps her hands like a gleeful child. I think a very convenient picture is starting to emerge, D.S. Ennis. Don't you? This case is a piece of piss. Joe sighs the sigh of a very troubled man. Maybe it's all a bit too convenient, he says. Nah, a kill's a kill. Pen it on Donna. On the lot of them. And remember, she says, walking away this time. I want the name of that supplier in France, and you've got four days to sort the whole lot out. Drugs, murder, everything. Joe looks up to the gods, directly at me. He holds my gaze. I'll process that later. Chapter 14 Donna 3am and I'm alone in the glass house. Moonlight fills the space with a calming silver light. This building has always been my safe space, but tonight I've locked myself inside. And I can't help but feel like I'm a little fish in a great big bowl, with many unseen sets of eyes bearing down upon me. Uncle Jago was pretty much useless and shaking like a jelly when I walked him home at midnight. Joe had interviewed him and been gentle from what I could see. The bogus note I supposedly sent him is nonsensical and apparently went along the lines of, had a call to say there's a stray piglet with a mark like a cross on its ear down Nanjizzle Cove. I reckon it's Banjo. I've got a stand-in for your part if you want to go and look. Hope she's all right. Donna. Jago never bothered to check if the piglet in question was missing, but dashed straight to Nanjizzle and searched for an hour with a flashlight in the dark. Both facts are concerning, because it means that whoever left the bogus note knew Jago's whereabouts and was familiar with his personality sufficiently to know that he would behave that way. And they also knew other details, including information about the pigs, such as their names and the logistical details of the play. Jago is adamant that his dog suit was stolen, but I'm almost certain that Jack was wearing a different suit. Someone must have ordered a replica suit, but how on earth did Jack know the details of the play and the exact make of the suit? And where is Jago's suit? I make a note to myself to phone the dog suit company in the morning. Someone around here must have ordered another one recently, and I want to know who it was. Detective work is quite simple, really. I put down my pen and rest my face in my hands, feeling overwhelmed. There are several floral bouquets that need to be put together for delivery by lunchtime tomorrow, which means I must be out in the flower patches and cutting by 6am. Florist's tip. It's important to cut garden flowers first thing in the morning when the stems are full of water and nice and turgid. Anyhow. I reckon Joe Ennis will pitch up at around 9am, and as I'm the main suspect in this fiasco, it's vital that I stay several steps ahead of Joe and work out what the hell to do, what to say, and exactly how to act. Because if there's one thing I'm certain of, it's this. I've got form. I've got the means and the motive to kill Jack. 
and 20 quid, or 50 if you're Joe, says I'm back in cuffs by tea time. So, as the DCI said earlier, what do we know? The straightforward solution is that the person in the dog suit who ran through the audience at the beginning of the play was Jack Crowless. And unless one of the players did it, which I doubt, someone must have sailed a boat to the bottom of the cliffs, scaled the cliffs carrying a toy train, jumped over the railings and accessed the kennel via the back panel. The Hessian sacking acting as a screen meant no one would see the interloper. This person then stabbed him in the neck. Let's ignore the fact for a moment that his neck had swollen inside the dog collar leading to strangulation. Slipped out via the back panel, then fled back down the rocks. I know that such a stunt is possible in the time they had without a rope, although one of the players could have been in on it and released the rope, if there had been one, and thrown it down to the sea once the murderer left. But why would Jack have wanted to be in the play in the first place? as a clever way of getting the drugs ashore? Were the drugs in the bag smuggled in by Jack? Most probably. He had been looking for a foolproof place to do a drop last night. But how did he know what to do or how to act in the performance? I remember what the DCI said about the most obvious solution, etc. But the only obvious solution is that Jago and I were in cahoots to kill Jack. The only obvious solution is that I offered him a part in the play, gave him a slow-release drug that made him unconscious shortly after being shut in the kennel, and also caused his neck to swell, made sure the collar couldn't untighten because of the zip tie, which I have here at Penberth, clearly. And, for good measure, I then thrust my own personal knife in his neck when I was off stage as some kind of revenge calling card. And then as if that wasn't enough, left a toy train on his back because of what he did to my dog. The bastard. The absolute bastard. Yep, that is the obvious solution. By my reckoning, the murderer would need to have access to the following. Slow-release poison. How else would anyone stab Jack without a fight? and I've got loads of plants around the place that can act as poison. Zip ties, ditto. A means of getting into the back of the kennel during the show, check. An in-depth knowledge of the play, uh, hello. A Thomas the Tank Engine toy train, not difficult to get hold of. I recently gave one away in a box of old toys we donated to the church jumble sale. And a motive. Where do I start? That's it then. My first crime is solved. I did it. Only, it wasn't me. But if not me, then who? Who else had the means and the motive to kill Jack Crowless? In other words, who set me up? The motive? Lots of people. The means? Only those people with an in-depth knowledge of the play and access to the stage and my knife like the players. A flyer for Sleeping Dog's Lie sits on the table in front of me. I turn the programme over and glance down the list of performers. In a life-imitating art kind of a way, I realise that we are all now playing the very same roles. Only for real this time. Weird. Awful. Shocking. But also quite exciting. My phone pings. It's a text from a withheld number. Don't you ever worry about sitting alone at night. I'm watching you. Ah, not so exciting after all, then. Chapter 15 Joe Ennis is in the station incident room, looking as mad as hell. Three constables and his desk sergeant are sitting across from him. I want to know everything about Jack Crowless and his activity over the past week, he barks. Who he saw, where he went, what he ate, where he stayed, when he had a shit, everything. Every single detail of his sorry, pathetic existence needs to be catalogued and checked. Someone 
will know something. Find that person. Build me a picture. And Demelza? She glances up from her notebook and offers Joe an adoring smile. Yes, sir? Get a climber on those cliffs at the Minac. I want him. Or her, says one of the constables. Or her, sorry. There today. And I want to know if they're scalable without a rope. And there's a cave under those cliffs, so get them to search the cave too. He pauses for dramatic effect. Now. Joe retires to his office and leans back in his chair, puts his hands behind his head and allows himself a smile. Jack Crowless, the bane of his life, is dead. Actually dead. Stiff as a board by now. Even the grotesque memory of his purple, pufferish face sticking out of that bloody ridiculous dog suit can't dampen Joe's spirits. Some people are born bad and die bad, like the ugly witches in fairy tales. And Jack Crowless was one of them. He may as well have been wearing sparkly red shoes. Joe considers having a quick celebratory dance around the office while singing Ding Dong the Witch is Dead. But there's a window between him and the outer office where Demelza and the rest of the officers sit. And as fragile as it is, he has a reputation to uphold. In many ways, it's a day like any other. His reusable cup is sitting on the desk full of Skinny Pete's excellent coffee. His childhood sweetheart, Donna Nightshade, is dominating the headlines of the Penzance packet. And he's missed, ignored, ten calls from Bill Smiley. So yes, it's just an ordinary day at the office. Except for the fact that Jack Crowless finally did something good for the world. He removed himself from it. Joe looks at yet another photo of Donna on the front page of the newspaper. She looks shocked, but also just a little bit euphoric. And why shouldn't she? Ding dong, etc. But whether he likes the idea or not, all fingers point in her direction. If only he could bury the whole thing. The witch is dead, after all. Let him remain so, and well done to whomever the murderer was. Donna. It was Donna. But if only he had the power to decide which crimes were worthy of investigating and which could be thrown into the who cares bin, life would be so much easier. As the play suggested, let sleeping dogs lie. Or dead dogs, in this case. But what if, what if the murderer wasn't Donna? And what if whoever stuck the knife in is a nutter on the rampage? What if Joe is about to uncover a whole new underworld of crime? It's possible. After all, someone supplied the drugs. Now wouldn't that be something? Joe Ennis, the new darling of Devon and Cornwall police. He imagines himself receiving his MBE. He would wear grey wool. Feeling more elated than he should, Joe drinks his coffee and looks at the paper. He tries to think of scenarios that don't reveal Donna as a murderer until the phone rings. It's DCI Penworthy, with the results of the post-mortem. I only take cash for my winnings, by the way. He ends the call and his forehead crashes onto the photo of Donna on the desk, because everything, absolutely everything, has just changed. Chapter 16 Joe hasn't driven down the track to Penberth Manor since he arrested Donna all those years ago, when they were young and more than a bit foolish. Well, she was. Joe wasn't. There have been many times when he has wanted to return to Penberth, times when he has driven over from Penzance with every intention of dropping by and suggesting bygones be bygones. But he has never managed to venture beyond the big stone arch that sits at the foot of the drive. Joe Ennis was, and forever would be, the turncoat who put Donna in the clink. The man who put the cuffs on when he could have looked the other way. There was no question that he was in her book. And once you were in the nightshade book of Ye Deadly Wrecker's Curses, or whatever it was called, there was simply no getting out of it. He was only surprised that he'd lived this long. And yet, 
Here he is, Detective Sergeant Ennis, driving an unmarked grey BMW. The whole of Penzance knows it's him. Down the potholed, rickety track that leads to the gothic wonder of Penberth Manor. They would all be there, no doubt. Donna, Carenza, Uncle Jago and Lamorna, along with a few more hangers-on than 18 years ago. A nightshade had attempted to kill Jack before, of course. That barking mad aunt of hers had got herself banged up in prison as a result. But, please God, he thinks as he grabs his jacket from the back seat and quickly checks out his hair in the wing mirror. This time, let it not be his Donna who stuck the knife in. Please let her be as innocent as the snowdrop posies she delivers for free to the old folks' homes in February. Or at least, if not innocent, then 27 steps ahead of him and able to completely cover her tracks. Joe doesn't bother knocking on the glorious and ancient oak front door to the main house, because the only person who ever seemed to spend any time in the big house, he remembers, was Uncle Jago. And although he very much needed to speak with him again, it was Donna who would receive the benefit of his attention today. He heads towards the walled garden, Donna's favourite place, opens the painted wooden door, and there she is, sitting on a swing seat just inside the wall, next to a bed of bright orange dahlias. Looking amazing, wearing shorts, flip-flops, a vest top, and a chunky emerald green cardigan. Donna didn't really feel the cold until late November, he remembers, before thinking that he really did hold on to too much information about this woman. She's looking at her phone. Her long, shiny hair is loose and curly and pulled around one shoulder. This is the first time they've been alone together in years. And if Joe didn't know better, he'd say that she's been waiting for him. He thinks about shaking her hand, but his heart is going like the clappers and his palms are sweaty. Nice suit, she says, looking up from her phone. She stills the swing with her feet. Prada? Joe laughs, although it's more of an awkward titter, really. Something like that, he says. I'm honoured. She stands and tucks her phone into her left bra cup. I hope it's your... She lowers her voice to a manly tone. Suit I wear when interviewing murder suspects. Suit? Joe doesn't respond. He's just amazed that she hasn't ordered him out of the garden. The lack of a prickle is disconcerting too. She's teasing him, yes, but there's no prickle. And that's not quite right. Let's go into the greenhouse, she says, turning her back to him and walking away. We can do the thing properly in there. She stops and turns to look at him. Or are you going straight for the cuffs again? There it is. No cuffs, he says. Just the obvious questions. She starts to walk again, while throwing her conversation over her shoulder for Joe to catch. Like, why was there a dead man on the stage of the Minac with a knife with my name on it stuck in his neck? That kind of thing, yes. The knife has been missing for a few days, although I'm not sure which day I saw it last exactly, before you ask. She steps into the glass house. I have been interviewed already, and Demelza was pretty thorough, so... Joe follows her through the door. Some key evidence has come to light, he says, meaning that we need to speak to everyone again. He glances around. Absolutely nothing in this place has changed. And I'm hoping you'll be able to give me your opinion on something else. Something plant-related. Because they found a poison in his blood? She asks, deadpan. And the poison came from a plant? How does she do it? Second-guessing him all the damn time. And why incriminate herself by admitting that she knows so much? The woman can never help herself. Something like that, he says. Donna gestures towards a stool on the other side of the workbench. 
The scent in the greenhouse has awarded him with the familiar scent of spending warm summer days with Donna here at Penberth. It's the scent of pure teenage contentment. He tries to push a reel of memories from his mind. Memories of the two of them laughing, playing, fighting. Coffee? Donna walks over to a filter coffee jug that's bubbling away while Joe takes a seat on the bench. It's his old seat, where he used to sit and watch her work and try to persuade her to come out on the boat. But coffee? That's unexpected. He starts to relax a little. Could it really be that she started to forgive him? And no, I haven't forgiven you, she says with her back to him as she pours. But we're going to need to get along if the two of us are going to get anywhere with this investigation. She reaches across the bench and offers him the cup before taking a seat herself. The two of us, he repeats, taking the cup. It's my first case, as it happens. Ah, the Edge of the World Detective Agency. I heard about that. Don't be dismissive. I'm not. Yes, you are, she chides. Your mouth always goes into a reluctant twitch when you're amused, Joe Ennis. Even so, I must admit that you're the expert and I'd be grateful for a few pointers. Joe puts down his cup, noting that she called him by his full name. Hmm. Who's paying your investigation fee? He asks. I am. Jack was a relative of sorts, so I'm putting it down as a business expense. Of course she is. And let's not forget that a man was found dead, murdered, during the performance of my play, and I'm almost certainly your lead suspect. As far as I'm concerned, I'm entitled to investigate the hell out of it, if only to save myself from the gallows. Don't you think? Joe wants to say, don't be silly, you're not a suspect. But he can't, so he carries on drinking, if only to hide his twitching mouth. But when he takes out his notebook and pen, Joe knows he hasn't felt this happy in a very long time. Here they are, the two amigos, back together again. But with the kind of questions he needs to ask, the bonhomie can't last for long. Good God, shouts Donna, and all of it cocaine. Joe has just admitted to the size of the stash that was hidden inside the vicar's rucksack. Yep, that's quite the heist, Detective Sergeant. You must be chuffed. But poor Gabby, what a shock for her to have it found in her rucksack like that. I'll pop by and see her later. Take her some of Jago's lemon drizzle. She'll need it. She's been with the drug squad all morning. But you can't think Gabby had anything to do with it, Joe. She's a bloody vicar. She's obviously been set up. Joe thinks better of saying... If you're going to be a successful detective, you need to park preconceived ideas at the door and instead flicks through a few pages in his notebook before eventually saying, Brugmansia. Brugmansia? It's a plant. The pathologist has confirmed that there were traces of it in his blood. Any ideas where someone might find it? Toxic stuff, she says. How much had he been given? A lot. Enough to kill him? Joe's phone rings. It's the coroner's office. Sorry, I need to take this. He swipes right. DS Ennis. Just wait a moment, please. Joe nods towards the door. Back in a sec. When Joe steps back into the glass house two minutes later, he knows two important things. The first is that Jack Crowless was poisoned not once, but twice before the knife went in. The first was from a draft of Brugmansia, which had been administered perhaps days before. And as for the second, a tiny pinprick was found up his nose, which is where a second poison was administered just before he died. Rookie mistake. And that second poison wasn't Brugmansia at all. It was Atropa Belladonna a.k.a. Deadly Nightshade. 
It was as if the murderer wasn't content with killing him with one attempt, but just kept going and going. Fair enough, he was a difficult one to kill, was Jack Crowless. I was wondering if you're familiar with that plant at all. With Rugmancia, says Joe, returning to the stool. Donna laughs. Familiar with it? Come on, why don't you just ask what you really want to ask? Joe's face is impassive. Which is? Do I have Bromancia here at Penberth? And do you? Donna sits back on her stool and smiles. I do, and to coin a pantomime phrase, it's behind you. Joe turns around sharply, like there's a gunman at his back. Donna laughs, puts on her gardening gloves, and walks around the bench to join him. A flamboyant-looking potted plant sits on the low windowsill. It stands two metres high, and unbeknownst to Joe, one of the flower heads has been resting on his shoulder the whole time. A little bit of pollen sits on his shoulder. Donna brushes it off with her glove. Say hello to Brugmansia Feingold, she says, assessing the plant with obvious admiration. The leaves are large and the flowers, bright orange, are pendulous. It's also known as angel's trumpet. It's native to South America and, as you are obviously aware, it's highly toxic. She lifts a trumpet and puts her nose to it. Want to smell? Joe takes a sniff and quickly realises that it's the same scent he's always associated with the big glass house at Penberth. And with Donna, come to that. It's lovely, but deadly. Yep, that would be just about right. And you don't mind having it around the place when it's so toxic, he asks. She looks at him squarely. Loads of common or garden plants are toxic. And if I didn't have it, how else could I poison people? Donna. She drops the flower head. All right, keep your knickers on. I have it here because it's beautiful and also is part of the family. Joe shakes his head. You're related to plants now? Of course I am. She's flirting. Definitely flirting, thinks Joe. This little beauty is a relation of Atropa Belladonna, who I'm named after, as you'll remember. Donna nods to the tattoo on her leg, otherwise known as Deadly Nightshade. Joe looks at her thigh and glances away while thinking, great legs, but also Deadly Nightshade. Donna leans her back against the bench. Rugmancia has been quite the naughty little plant then. Her face hardens. Although we should never blame a beautiful plant for the actions of the person who misuses her, should we, Joe? Joe hasn't time for her games. He thinks of grabbing Donna's hand and telling her about the deadly nightshade in Jack's bloodstream, telling her to run away, run right away. But if you really want to know all about it, she adds, you should know that it's used for good purposes too. Such as? Oh, all kinds of things. For extracting important alkaloids and for lots of other medicinal things that, to be honest, I have absolutely no idea about. And do you have to import them from South America, these types of plants? Are they tricky to get hold of? Donna has begun deadheading a pelagonium at the end of the bench. Mm, not particularly. I got this one at the garden centre at Brieg five years ago. Honestly, Joe, relax with all the cloak and dagger stuff. It's a perfectly safe plant if you know how to handle it. And what if you don't? Then you could kill someone. Or make them feel really poorly, at the very least. Joe picks up his coffee cup and stares into it, rather than allow her to read his expression or see his twitching lips. What if she's just playing with him? Donna is nothing if not unpredictable. What if it really is Donna who's on a rampage of revenge? What if she killed Jack and now she's out to poison everyone in her book? Joe is in her book. Maybe the coffee is... She stops deadheading. 
don't worry, I have no intention of seeking my revenge by poisoning you, if that's what you're thinking. Joe forces a smile and knocks back his coffee, which suddenly tastes a little bitter. Who else around here would know about the effects of a plant like this? He asks. Donna shrugs and picks up a spray bottle. She mists an asparagus fern. A plantsman, perhaps? Or anyone with a knowledge of South American culture? The bottle spraying stops. Joe hears a cog click into place in Donna's mind. You've thought of something, he says. She starts to spray again, her back to him. It's nothing. I just remembered that Brugmansia is used in South America by shamans to alleviate ailments. That's all. She's lying. He leaves it. And it's used there in a good way, right? That all depends on the shaman. Some shamans are good, some are not so good. What would a bad shaman do with it? She turns to face him, and with the look of someone on the periphery of unhingement, says, Magic! She laughs and returns to her stool. You're winding me up, says Joe. I'm being perfectly serious. Black magic rituals are still performed in some parts of the world, mainly by those bad men I was talking about. Or women, thinks Joe, having learnt this lesson from his constable. Why? To bring on hallucinations. Donna pauses again. There is an idea slowly piecing itself together in her mind. And then Joe remembers that hallucinations are something a previous nightshade boss lady knew all about. Her auntie Deadly, a.k.a. Jack Crowless's wife, a.k.a. the woman who is still in prison for his attempted murder, the woman who suffered terribly from hallucinations. And she suffered all this purely because someone, unproven, but let's face it, it was Jack, had been slowly poisoning her which is why she got off with a spell in a psychiatric prison. And are there any practicing shamans around here? He asks. She answers him too quickly. No. And which bit is the dangerous bit? All of it, but especially the leaves and the seeds. Through ingestion? Yes. And what kind of symptoms would you get if you ingested it? Donna rolls her eyes. Jesus, I have no idea, Joe. He writes a few notes in his book to give her a moment. And who else knows that you have one here? He asks. Donna sighs. Everyone? No one? I've no idea. And I don't just have one either, so write that down in your book. I have three. She cocks her head and assesses him. You know... You could easily have looked up Brugmansia on Wikipedia or asked the toxicologist in Truro to give you the rundown. I could, agrees Joe. But you wanted to ask me so you could see if I have it at Penberth. I did. Am I a suspect? Everyone is a suspect. And by everyone, you mean the players. What's the point of lying? I mean the players. All right. Let's go through them now, she says. Donna, no, you're right. This needs to be done properly or not at all. What was the time of death? What did the coroner say? He died towards the end of the second act, but he could have been poisoned within the half hour before that. I take it his throat swelled as a result of the poison, and then the collar, that he couldn't remove, tightened and strangled him. She so did it thinks Joe. You take it correctly. Right. The question is, who had access to the back of the kennel? Let's go through them. I already have, he says, cutting her off. And every single one of them had enough time in the dressing room alone while the others were on stage and could have slipped out the back and done it, including you. Lamorna's silhouette was visible in the music tent the whole time. She leans across the table and grabs his empty cup. No surprises that I'm suspect number one. She tips her head to one side and smiles. I suppose you've heard by now that I threatened to kill him. I have. 
She slams the cup down. And why the hell shouldn't I kill him? She leans across the table again. Joe would be dizzy if not for her sharp green eyes being fixed like daggers on his. But I'll tell you this, Joe Ennis. If I was going to kill him, I wouldn't have used Angel's trumpet to finish him off, that's for damn sure. Why? She smiles wryly. Because there is simply no other way to smile in situations like this. Because it's not quite deadly enough. She sniffs in conclusion. There's too much of a margin for error. And which plant, which poison, would you have used instead, seeing as how you're the expert? He's leading her in the wrong direction. He knows it. Oldest trick in the book, but... She sits back once more, looking smug. To kill Jack Crowless? What else but the best plant for the job? Which is? Deadly nightshade, obviously. There it is. Donna jumps off the stool, walks to the glasshouse door and opens it. The shrug of the left shoulder is infinitesimal, but it's enough to show him that she's ready for him to leave. It's also enough to sober him into some straight talking. He remains seated. And when you say deadly nightshade, are you referring to the plant or to yourself? Donna doesn't answer, but nods more definitely towards the garden. It's over. He grabs his jacket and walks towards the door. Can't you just leave it this time, Joe? She whispers, placing a hand on his arm. No one cares that he's dead. The whole town, the whole county can relax without him in it. He was bad news. You know he was. Joe shakes his head. Look, Donna, even if I wanted to. She rips her hand away. What's the matter, Joe? She spits. Frightened you'll lose the bet? Same old Joe Ennis. You're not a person anymore. You're just a machine, spouting out regulations and rules and restrictions. No thoughts, no feelings. And if you want to know how I know about the bet between you and Penworthy, I'll tell you. I was listening in to your cosy summation at the Minac. I had earbuds in. I know, he says. Who do you think asked Louise to give them to you? The pause between them is cavernous. Even so, says Donna, clearly flustered. Look, begins Joe. The moment a policeman even thinks about going rogue, the rule of law is over. I can't cherry pick my cases. I can't bury a murder case just because the man was the devil and Donna Nightshade has asked me to. He puts on his jacket and turns to leave. But ten paces down the gravel path, his heart fills with... What? Rage? No. Indignation? Yes. Definitely indignation. He marches back to the glasshouse door. She's returned to her stool. Her elbows are on the table and her head is in her hands. You want my help? He says. Then think about this. A man was found murdered on stage while performing in a play you wrote. He had large quantities of brogmansia in his blood, which is a plant you have on the premises. He also, and I shouldn't tell you this, but what the hell, had a further poison in his system, which, can you guess what it was? None other than our old friend Atropa Belladonna. Deadly nightshade. Oh yes, you might look at me now, but I'm not quite finished. The dog collar around his neck put there by you, as far as I can deduce, bearing in mind you wrote the bloody play and issued the costume, was impossible to release once the neck expanded from the effect of the poison. Not everyone would react in this way, but Jack would, because he had allergies, and, as a member of the family, by God, I bet you knew it. He steps closer. You were seen talking to him at the star two nights ago. Why? He wanted to see me. Why? To catch up. Bullshit. What did you talk about? The weather. And that induced you to threaten to kill him, did it? The weather can be quite an emotive subject, she says, using her finger to draw imaginary circles on the table. Joe stops his pounce and looks at her in the way 18-year-old Joe would have looked at 18-year-old Donna. Well, not quite the same way 
close. Just stop for a moment and think, he says. Don't keep incriminating yourself like it's some kind of amusing game. For the last time, what did Jack Crowless talk to you about at the pub? Donna's whole frame sinks. He wanted me to let him do a drugs drop at Penberth, which he said was his right because he's still married to Auntie Donna. They never divorced. He wanted to move back in and take over. Wanted to get the old gang back together. And why did you threaten to kill him? Seriously? You really need to ask me that question? Joe closes his eyes and pinches the space between his eyebrows. She's not lying. He knows that much. Truly, he can't blame her for anything she might have done. Even killing him. Are we done? She asks. Because I've got a business to run. Joe rests a hand on her arm. She doesn't wrench it away. I'll be working my way through all the players, and I suggest you do that by yourself. Quietly and carefully, and don't rule anyone out, even the vicar, because if you didn't kill Jack, then someone close to you did. If you don't tell me exactly what you know or who you suspect, and I know you suspect someone, then I can't help you or any of your friends who were clearly in the best position to do the job. You don't trust me. I get it. You hate me. I get it. The whole thing is totally bonkers. Jesus, even the audience laughed when they saw him lying there dead. But no matter what we thought of him, just to be perfectly clear, a man that you are known to despise, no, stop it, Donna, you hated him, was found dead on your turf with two drugs in his body that you have knowledge of and can easily access, not to mention the knife in his neck with your name on it. When I arrived here, you already knew they'd found poison in his blood. How? How did you know? A lucky guess? He grabs her arm tighter. Stop it right now and tell me. All right, I'll bloody tell you. It was obvious from the swelling around his neck and, as you said, I knew Jack carried an EpiPen in case of wasp stings and that kind of thing. We'd always joked that Auntie Donna should have just hidden his pen and shoved him into a wasp's nest. If you poison him, then you don't have to use your hands or even be there when he's strangled. Also, he came to me for help because he was frightened. Well, annoyed. He was sure someone was trying to do him in. When? Two days ago, the morning of the day I saw him in the star. Where? Here. He came to Penberth. He said he'd picked up one of my private detective cards at the pub and wanted me to do some digging around. And why did he need help, exactly? Asked Joe, who is not just frustrated, he's apoplectic. Because someone had been sending him hate mail through the post, threatening letters, that type of thing. To his mother's old place in Newlyn. Yes. Did he have any idea who was doing it? Possibly a one-handed man with an eye patch. Donna. What? I'm being serious. That's what he said. He told me in the pub that a one-handed man with an eye patch would be doing the next drop. Joe's done. He takes out a card from his wallet and puts it on the bench in front of her. My private number, he says. Just in case you need it. Any time. Donna looks at the card and nods. Joe takes a deep breath. I'll leave you to your day, he says. You've been very helpful, Miss Nightshade, and I thank you for your time. And if you could pin down the last time you had the knife in your possession, that would be beneficial to us both. He doesn't hesitate to dash away this time. And when he jumps in the car and starts the engine, the classic song, She, is playing on Pirate FM. Joe can't help but pause a moment to remember a teenage girl laughing up at him from the deck of a boat on a glorious summer's day. He shouldn't be leaving. He should be marching Donna to the station along with all the others, especially Jago. But some deep instinct warns Joe to go slowly, slowly this time. There's no hurry. Donna's right. Who cares who killed Jack Crowless, really? Penworthy. DCI Penworthy does. 
Chapter 17 Donna It's official. Joe Ennis is still the sexiest man in Cornwall. But I haven't got time to think about that now because the vicar has just walked in dressed for work. Jesus, she looks rough. Time to cheer her up. Well, if it isn't the pusher of Penzance, I say. Got any skunk for me this morning? She starts to cry. Wail, even. Too early for humour? I ask. She flops onto Joe's stool. I'll never laugh again, she says. Half an hour, two coffees and a whole packet of Jaffa cakes later, and I'm fully up to date with the past 12 hours of Gabby's life, which has been... Awful, Donna. Just awful. You have no idea how bad it is in a police station. Uh, hello? All those questions. And that Demelza woman is such a bitch. I never knew how different it would be to be in a cell rather than visiting one. It must have been awful for you, I say. My words are sympathetic, but my tone says, dry your eyes, buttercup, and buck up. Where is everyone? She asks, glancing around. That is a particularly good question. I'd guess that Jago is moping around with his pigs, and Lamorna said she wanted to go for a walk to reset her balance, so I'll be lucky to see her this side of next Wednesday. They all seem to forget that I'm trying to run a business here, and I haven't filled the roadside cart with any flower bunches for three days, so that's at least 50 quid a day I'm losing out on. I'll be honest with you, Gabby. We're borrowing from Peter to pay Paul now, and I'm not sure how much longer we can go on. What about Carenza? Can't she help today? I shake my head. She's gone to see Auntie Donna to break the news about Jack. Why? My answer is deadpan. He was her husband. Oh, yes, of course. Upsetting for her. Upsetting? They'll both be doing cartwheels across the prison lawns all afternoon. It'll be the best day of Auntie Donna's life. Gabby loosens her dog collar. She's been loosening her dog collar a lot lately. I open a fresh bag of coffee while she chatters on. Eventually, she gets to the point. The police were only concerned with asking me about the drug stash, but have they... I mean, do they... Do they think it was suicide, or was it... It was good old-fashioned murder, Gabby. I grab her cup to refill it once again and use it to gesticulate. And here's something else you might want to pray about the next time you're cozying up to that lord of yours. Joe Ennis? You're Joe Ennis? She asks. The policeman? He's not mine, but yes, Joe the copper has come to the quite correct conclusion that the murderer must have had in-depth knowledge of my play, my plants, the minac, the fact that I had form with Jack Crowless and issue over what happened with my dog. Why? What happened with your dog? Doesn't matter. Which means, she says. I faff about making coffee before answering, because in truth, I don't want to answer that question. I don't want to say, it means that I'm murder suspect number one, and as I'm pretty certain that I didn't do it, then one of you lot did but that's what I do eventually say as I hand her the cup. One of us? Gabby's eyes are finally open. She crosses herself. May the Lord in heaven preserve their soul, but why on earth? Because he was a dreadful man, Gabby. Dig deep enough and I guarantee that the others will all have some kind of dodgy dealings with Jack Crowless. Who was it that put the drugs in your bag? Have you asked yourself that? Oh, I have, she says. But surely you would have known if one of us had wanted him dead, she says. Everyone has secrets, even you, I should think. Is that a blush? No, mark my words, there will be plenty of shenanigans that have gone down over the years that I'm not privy to. I grab a bucket of flowers that I'm prepping for a wedding florist that's made up mainly of dahlia café au lait. Heavenly. I take one out and strip surplus leaves from a stem. You know what they say, Gab? 
Keep your enemies close, but your friends closer. She stops drinking. It's the other way around. I look at her over the top of imaginary glasses. Not in this case. No, there's nothing else for it. I'm going to have to dig the dirt on my mates and my family and find out which one of them slotted Jack Crowless. And also, who slid the drugs into your rucksack and before Joe Ennis beats me to it. Or worse, before he pins the whole thing on me. Out of interest, why did you have a big, presumably empty rucksack with you anyway? It wasn't empty when I arrived, she said. It had the after-party pastries and nibbles in from Little. I'd taken them out and put them on the trestle table. That's right, she had. Her hands rushed her face. But Lord Almighty, Donna, what if you do find out that it was one of us that did it? Could be tricky for you. Awkward, you know? She starts to play with an ear. I mean, w would you grass them up or... To the police? You've got to be kidding. No nightshade would ever do that. I pop the dahlia back in the bucket and grab a folder containing today's order invoices. You wouldn't do me a favour and write out message cards for me, would you? I ask. For the bouquet orders? Uh, of course. She relaxes into a smile and removes her dog collar completely. You wouldn't believe how uncomfortable this thing gets, she says. Just ask Jack, I say, laughing out loud for the first time in what seems like ages. My joke goes down like a lead balloon, so I spin the invoice folder across the table. There you go, I say, leaning backwards on the stool to grab a flower pot full of message cards and pens from the back dresser. If you open the file, you'll see page dividers for each day of the month. Just open today's date and you'll find messages printed out at the bottom of each invoice. It'll take your mind off things. All you need to do is copy the message onto the card. Best handwriting, please. Gabby gets herself organised and with pen in hand, reads out the first message. You are the sexiest woman on earth. I'm desperate for you. We'll be together one day, won't we? She glances up. Her eyes are certainly open now. Bloody Nora she says, scanning the invoice. Who sent that? Ah, that message. My lips are sealed, I'm afraid, I say with a wink. After all, confidentiality is the... I begin to make a hand-tied bouquet. Sixth, no, seventh rule of floristry. She laughs. Really? What are the first six? I add a second stem. Proportion, scale, harmony, rhythm, a nice bit of balance, and finally, unity. Gabby laughs. It sounds like a catechism. It is, in a way. Now get on with your writing. She works through the invoices while I begin putting together the sexy woman bouquet. From old man Bozzolo again. Until I sense that she stopped writing. You don't want to see this message, she says, looking up from the folder. Don't be silly, of course I do. Pass it over. There are tears in her eyes as she hands me the folder. A handwritten note has been stapled to the order. It reads, Please deliver a funeral-style bouquet to Jack Crowless in Newlyn. Card reads, In memory of Jack Crowless. An absolute cock. Cash enclosed. He really did have someone out to get him then, I murmur, rereading the message. My eyes search the invoice for details of the sender, but there's no email address, no telephone number, nothing. Someone, Carenza, has created an order slip and written, received in the post with a hundred pounds cash, on the invoice. Gabby is crying again. She dabs her misty eyes with her sleeve and pulls herself together. Sorry, she says. 
I'm tired, that's all. It's been so awful. And now you're in a position where you're forced to suspect all your friends. Hmm, I murmur, not really listening. Yes, I suppose I am. This order must have arrived yesterday, or maybe the day before. The cogs of my brain begin to clank a few facts into place uncomfortably. Which was... Before Jack was killed, she says. Mark my words, I say, in my firm don't argue with me voice. I reckon these flowers were sent from whoever it was that was trying to put the frighteners on him, and probably killed him. But at least it means that I've got one less order to do and got paid for it, so it's a win-win, really. Frighteners? she asks. Yes. Some poor sod had obviously come a cropper with Jack and decided to take their revenge by sending him threatening notes. That's what he said, anyhow. Jack wanted me to find out who it was. Too late now, though, eh? She nods regretfully. Yes, she sighs. Too late now. Will you tell the police about it? About this? A dodgy message someone attached to a funeral flower order, an order that was placed before he was dead. I scrunch my nose. Nah. I mean, clearly I should, but I probably won't. No, I'll keep this little nugget to myself for now. Like I said, I want to stay one step ahead of Joe Ennis, if I can. I take the invoice out of the file and put it in an envelope inside the drawer I keep locked at the far end of the greenhouse. Returning to the bench, I continue to put together an arrangement for a man who's having an affair with an ex-mayor's wife. Gabby lets out a long, relaxing sigh. Well, she says, knocking back the dregs and putting down the pen, with several message cards left unwritten. Must get on. She's halfway to the door before I can say, Hey, slacker, you haven't finished your job. She laughs, shrugs, and carries on walking. Oh, and Gabby? She turns around. You forgot your dog collar. That got her attention. She glances towards the stiff white collar on the table, looking at it oddly for a moment, like it's something alien and unpleasant. I pick it up to hand it to her and see that a zip tie, to be fair, it's an unfastenable one, has been glued to the inside of the collar. Many words go unspoken. Catch you later, yeah? I say, as she snatches the collar and stuffs it in her pocket. Yeah, later, she says absently, and I hear a, God bless, thrown across the garden in my direction as she hurries away. Hmm. I close my eyes and take a long breath in through my nose and let it out through my mouth, like Carenza once taught me to do. My mind is a blank page, with nothing but question marks written all over it. When I focus, I realise that I've been staring at the Brugmansia and remember my conversation with Joe. There is a bookshelf at the far end of the glasshouse that requires my immediate attention. I run an eye along a line of mainly gardening books until I spot the one I'm looking for. An Encyclopedia of Shamanism by Christina Pratt. A quick flick down the index leads me to the Brugmansia page, and I see that someone has written, Need to break the soul tie, in the margin. After speed reading the etymology and toxicology of the plant, I read, Brugmansia induces a powerful trance with violent and unpleasant effects, sickening after-effects, and at times, temporary insanity. Disconnection from reality, psychosis, and amnesia of episode, such as one example reported in Psychiatry and Clinical Neuroscience, of a young man who amputated his own penis and tongue after drinking only one cup of Brugmansia tea. Another note in the margin reads, This will be perfect. Ah. I close the book and tap my fingers on the cover before absently opening the cover again, where a handwritten dedication on the opening leaf reads, To Ms. Nightshade, the most talented and fascinating student I ever met, from Shaman Paolo. 
My phone pings. Unknown number. Cozying up to the police now. Keep your nose out, Nightshade. Or else. Chapter 18 Lamorna is sitting with her arms wrapped tightly around her legs, on a seat high up in the gods at the top of the Minak Theatre. She's in her dungarees as usual, but is wearing a chunky sky-blue argyle jumper over the top of them, to guard against the strengthening westerly wind, no doubt. Joe notices her the moment he steps on the top terrace, not because he's familiar with the back of Lamorna's head, but because of the bird of paradise sitting on her shoulder. After a quick wave to the constable guarding the stage, Joe stands at the end of a line of grass-covered stone seats and coughs. Oh, hello, Inspector. Lamorna glances up. I've been waiting for you. The constable down there said you'd be back before too long, so I thought it best to wait. Joe edges his way down the narrow aisle and is about to take a seat next to her when Lamorna cries out, Wait! His arse shoots upwards like he's just sat on hot coals. The grass is damp, she says, and that's a nice suit. She grabs her raincoat and lays it out for him to sit on. There you go. That should keep you nice and presentable. Thanks, says Joe, sitting down. Now then, how can I help? Although you should know that I'm not an inspector. The real inspector was here last night. Gone back to Truro, has she? Asks Lamorna. Gone back to Truro. Would you rather speak to her? Ruby fluffs her feathers and sticks her beak in Joe's ear. Ruby, chides Lamorna. Be good or go home. Ruby walks around Lamorna's back and sits on the other shoulder, looking away. No, it's you that I want to speak to, she says. I thought it probably best to speak to you straight away because I suppose you'll have worked it all out by now. Joe shakes his head. Not yet, no. A few ideas have come to mind, but nothing concrete. What about you? Any ideas? Lamorna, who is looking out to sea and seems like an otherworldly character from Tolkien, possibly elvish, says, Perhaps. And after a good minute of them both sitting there staring at the troubled ocean, she adds, You haven't brought the cuffs, then? Joe laughs. What is it about the nightshades and handcuffs? They're in the car, he says. No, I've just come for another look around and to check on my constable down there. He nods towards the stage. In that case, she says while standing up, and after a dramatic slap of the legs, I'd better save you all lots of bother, wasting police time and all that, and just confess. She holds out her wrists. Slap them on, Inspector. I'm the chap you're looking for. Joe does not like the sound of this. Confess to what? He asks, trying to maintain an air of light conversation, as if it would be simply impossible for Lamorna Nightshade, ethereal, beautiful, childlike Lamorna Nightshade, to ever confess to... Murder, of course, she says, looking at him as if he's not quite the full shilling. What else? Chapter 19 Donna With the flower orders completed for the day, they're not my best, to be honest. Some of the colours clash and the filler is a bit shabby. I fly around town for an hour, delivering to my customers as discreetly as possible. Neither ambition is realised because absolutely everyone in Penzance knows that Jack Crowless is dead and absolutely everyone thinks I did it. The pats on the back and offers of free drinks have been endless. I return to my swing seat in the walled garden with my investigator's notebook and best pen in hand. But where to start? I make a mind map of everything Joe said. Well, not everything. The man went on a bit but cover the pertinent points and draw a circle around an offshoot that reads, tip off note to Joe. A line leads to another bubble that reads, tone is familiar, and from that another line leads directly to Uncle Jago? 
Did Jago send the tip-off note to Joe stating that Jack would have drugs on him last night? If so, how did he know? I smiled to myself. It's obvious, really. Jago may love music and pigs, but his first love is the pub. The Admiral Benbow, the Turk's Head, the Star, the Yacht. They're all his haunts, and he could easily have got wind of something that was going down last night. He was skulking in a corner of the star with a pint of Spingo in hand on the night I met Jack, come to think of it. I draw another line on my mind map that reads, Jack's dog suit? Who ordered it? I grab my phone and search the internet to find the telephone number of the dog suit company, Fancy Pants, which is just up the road in Red Ruth. A young male voice answers. Fancy Pants? His voice does not convey enthusiasm for his job. I'm going to need to lie. Hi, yes, I want to order a dog suit from you, but... He interrupts me with... Jack Russell, Dalmatian, or mongrel of indeterminate breeding. What? That's all we got left. There's been a rush on pugs. That's fine. It's the mongrel I'm after. But I just want to check in case one of my employees has ordered one already. Can you check for me, please? Postcode? Tricky. What I want him to check is if a suit was sent to the Penzance region lately, and I only know one postcode by heart. My own. After a little tapping, he comes back with, Someone ordered a mongrel of indeterminate breeding, short man size, online, to be delivered to that address by same-day express delivery. There's a note with the order saying to leave the parcel in the recycling box in the first stable on the left with the blue door. It was delivered yesterday afternoon. It says here it was hand-delivered and signed for. By whom? I ask. Some feller called Nightshade? Is he one of yours? He certainly is. Oh, Jago. Uncle Jago is standing by the fire in his study when I go in. Jago always has a fire on the go, even in midsummer, which costs me a fortune in kiln-dried logs. But he says he needs a fire on account of the study's small north-facing window, thick walls, and, as he claims, the thin blood of the nightshade male line. It will be my first proper interview in my new role as a private investigator. It's exciting, really. I'll start by asking him about the other note, the one saying the pig was missing. And what did the note say, exactly? I ask, taking a seat in a high-backed leather armchair in front of the fire. Jago takes a seat opposite me. His identical chair is more comfortable than mine, having had more use. Note? He says. Yes, uncle, the note. The one you said you received last evening telling you one of the piglets was missing. Jago bristles at this. I didn't say I received it. I did receive it. It was from you. At least that's what I thought at the time. A bit defensive for Jago. I let it go. And where is it now? What? Jesus. The note. I don't have it. You didn't keep it? No. God, give me strength. It was evidence, Uncle. You should have kept it. Ah, but remember, I didn't know that it was evidence at the time. I thought it was nothing more than a quick missive from you, so I disposed of it. Disposed of it? He looks at the fire. Is that a problem? I sigh. But thinking about it, if the note was written by one of our own, if one of the players did indeed kill Jack, then it's probably best that the note is gone. Uncle may have helped, dear man. Still, there's something about Jago that seems shifty today, and the whole situation with the dog suit doesn't add up. He may be a sweet chap who wants to do nothing more than spend his days listening to Radio 3, reading literature, playing the violin and tending to his pigs. But the man knows something important about last night, or else why order another dog suit? 
I stand and open the window. It's like the Gobi Desert in here. I remember something I read during my How to Become a Detective research. It was all about how an interviewer should allow the interviewee to ramble on because they will eventually give something away through the desire to fill the ensuing awkward gaps in conversation. I don't think Uncle Jago will fall into that category of interviewee. He's picked up his pipe already and a copy of The New Scientist and is at his absolute happiest when sitting in front of the fire with a loved one close by while maintaining absolute silence. He wouldn't care a stuff if we didn't talk all day. What puzzles me, I say, is how the person in the dog suit... Jack, he states, not looking up from his magazine. Not necessarily, not at the beginning. The police say that we should not necessarily assume that. He looks up. Rubbish. Of course it was Jack. Right, but what I was saying was... How did the person, whoever it was, get their hands on a dog suit that you had here in your study? He turns back to the new scientist. I have no idea. Did you notice it had gone? No. Time to go in for the kill. So why did you order another dog suit to be delivered to this address on the day of the play? I go back to my chair, sit and wait for an answer. One comes, eventually, served with a side order of sheepish expression. Ah, well, you see, I didn't want to tell you. I know how worried you get about money, but but I... Well, I'm ashamed to say that I lost the last one. That's right, I remember now. I noticed it was gone and didn't want to give you extra work to do, so I ordered another one. You lost it? Where? He smiles. If I knew that, it wouldn't be lost. Uncle. I took it to the pub. What for? To give the chaps a laugh. Why order the replacement in short man size? You're over six feet tall. I I wasn't aware that I had. But regarding the new suit, Jack must have been wearing it. When did you notice that it had gone missing? Jago shrugs, all innocence. It was still here when I checked at around six. The blighter must have been watching my movements, broken in and taken it once I'd run off to find the pig. Broken in? Any sign of forced entry? I left the door unlocked. This, I decide, is impossible. Chapter 20 The last thing Joe Ennis wants to do is arrest another nightshade, especially Donna's younger sister, which is why he doesn't bundle Lamorna into the car and blue light her straight off to the station. Working on nothing more than a gut feeling that the girl with the Titian hair is probably protecting someone, her sister, she's protecting her sister, he suggests that they adjourn to the empty theatre cafe and informs Donna's mate Louise who is haranguing Joe to confirm a date when the police will bugger off and allow the theatre to reopen, that they are not to be disturbed. And can we have two coffees, please? He shouts after her. And perhaps a biscuit or two? Louise pauses with her back to him for a moment before walking away. Joe whispers to Lamorna not to spout forth with her confession until after the coffees have arrived, and all possible prying ears have retreated behind a closed door, which is why they spend a rather surreal ten minutes talking about birds of paradise, including details about the molting habits of macaws. Ruby, Lamorna explains, is molting now, and it's making her moody as all hell. She also explains how macaw feathers are as individual as human fingerprints. That's so interesting he says as the coffees arrive. Sugar? He opens a second sachet for himself. It's a sugary kind of a day. Lamorna smiles. Two, thank you. She's pretty fond of you, says Joe, nodding towards Ruby, who's having a bit of a bounce around the cafe. Lamorna looks at him straight and says with complete clarity, 
as if it's the most important thing in the world. She never leaves my side, Inspector. Never. Except occasionally to sit with Carenza, and sometimes she goes to Donna, but that depends on both their moods. They're very similar, you see. Donna and Carenza, he asks. Donna and Ruby, they're both Virgos. Lamorna eyes him knowingly, before taking a sip of coffee and adding, Anyhow, I'll cut to the chase. I killed Jack. Well, partly. Probably. Possibly. Joe sips on his coffee. It's too hot. He puts the mug down. Lamorna's brow furrows. You haven't taken out your notebook. Aren't you going to write any of this down? Not for now. You haven't told me how you did it yet. Why don't you start at the beginning and tell me exactly what happened? Lamorna takes a deep breath. Well, for a start, I know that they found a drug in him, correct? Damn. Correct? How do you know? Because it was me that administered it. And what kind of poison was it? He asks, dreading the answer. Brogmancia. Shit. And how did you do it? I put it in a pasty. Cornish? Of course. When? The day before the play. I went to see him in the afternoon. Where? At his place in Newlyn, but he wasn't in. I knew he wasn't in. That's why I went. Joe considers taking out his notebook. This is not good. Go on. I left the pasty in the house with a note. We have a spare key as it's actually our house, you see. Another damn note. A note? Yes, instructing him to meet me at Logan Rock later that evening. She nods through the wall-to-wall -wall cafe windows towards a rocky headland about a quarter of a mile away further along the coast. I said in the note that I'd got something he wanted, something he'd always wanted, and he could have it if he left Donna alone. And what was that? The nightshade ruby. It's worth a mint. Joe's never heard of such a thing. You've got to be kidding. Lamorna looked at him as if she had no idea what the word kidding meant. I'm perfectly serious. It was stolen from the savage princess. That was a ship, not a real princess. By the fourth Donna nightshade. Auntie Donna could tell you the exact details if you needed to know. Perhaps you could pop to see her in prison. My sister wouldn't know anything about it, really, because she's too busy dashing about scratching a few pennies together to get into the detail of legends as laid out in the old nightshade diaries. Right, and how did Jack know about it, the ruby? Because he was married to Auntie Donna. And it's valuable, you say? It would be priceless. If only we could find the thing. Auntie Donna's mum, dead now, hid it somewhere, and then she forgot where. Dementia. Anyhow, the ruby was all that Jack ever really wanted, which is why I made out that I'd found it and he could have it. And why would he think you'd do that? Because I wanted him to leave Donna alone. He came to us, you see. He walked straight into the glass house the day before the play and said he'd got a few jobs for Donna to be getting on with. Dodgy, criminal jobs, you know. And if she didn't carry out his bidding, well, woof woof, which is a reference I know you'll understand. And how did Donna react to this? She was quiet, mainly. Stoic, obviously. But I think, well... I think deep down she was petrified. Lamorna narrows her eyes knowingly. Most people don't tend to think my sister can fear anything, but I know that she feared Jack. He wasn't a nice man, you see, and... What do I call you, if not Inspector? Joe is fine. Joe, she repeats softly, as if it's the nicest name in the world. Anyhow... He met her in the star that night, and I was worried. Worried? Worried she might get back in with him to protect us. I made my mind up to kill him later that evening. 
It really was the only way out of it, and it's what nightshades tend to do when they find themselves in a spot of bother or backed into a corner, you know? Lamorna pauses to allow Joe to speak, but he doesn't. He simply folds his hands around his coffee and waits. And then I realise that he might not take the letter, the one telling him to meet me at Logan Rock. Seriously, and that he might not eat the pasty either. It was a flawed plan, in retrospect. There were too many variables that might go wrong. Donna would be ever so cross if she knew. Knew that you'd been to his house? No, that I'd come up with a flawed plan. I see. I went to the star a couple of hours after I'd dropped off the pasty. To talk to Jack? Yes, he was bound to be there because he was meeting Donna later. Unless, of course, he'd eaten the pasty already. But he was there, and Uncle Jago was already talking to him, so I waited for Uncle to depart. How long were they talking? Quite a while. Half an hour? Did Jago see you? No, I hid in the back. Uncle left eventually, and I went straight to Jack, who laughed in my face about the pasty and the letter. I asked him if he was coming to meet me at Logan Rock, and, well, the long and short of it is that he said he'd only come if I gave him something else too. I don't think he believed me about the ruby. And what was that? Me. You? What do you mean, you? I believe he wanted to have sexual intercourse with me. Joe shakes his head. So I said yes. Anything to save my sister. And he confirmed that he would leave her alone if I let him have his way and give him the ruby. And we shook on it and he got up to go to the loo, which was when I slipped more Brugmansia into his pint. I'd made rather a big batch and had some left over. Clever. And did he come to the rock? Yes, a couple of hours or so later. I was already in position on top of the rock when he started clambering up, and it was obvious the Brugmansia had taken effect. He'd possibly eaten the pasty too by then, so he'd had a double dose. I wasn't nervous, because I'd taken Carenza's stop sign with me as a weapon, so I knew I was safe. Stop sign? She's a lollipop lady at Mousehole School. Right. Lamorna stands to act out the scenario. And when he'd almost reached me on top of the rock, I grabbed the stop sign and I whacked him with it. He fell quite a good way into the sea. It was quite a splash. The sign is dented in the shape of his head, if you want to check it. It'll probably have his DNA on it too, a hair follicle or something. Joe can't help but smile. And how did he end up in a dog suit on the stage at the Minac a day later? Lamorna shakes her head. I have absolutely no idea. He should have been dead already after that fall. And the poisoning, of course. Thank God. So why do you think it was you who killed him? Isn't it obvious? It was me who drugged him. And even if he survived the fall which he did. Jack Crowless died during the performance. Even so, can't you see? What must have happened is that the Brugmansia must have had some kind of delayed swelling process in him. I knew he'd swell up, you see, what with the EpiPen I saw sticking out of his jeans pocket when he came to Penberth, which is why the dog collar got too tight and subsequently why he died. No, it wasn't quite in the neat way, I'd hoped, with the body swallowed up by the sea, but them's the breaks. She holds out her wrists. Cuff me up, Joe. I reckon I'll get ten years for attempted murder, but I'm not too bothered, as I'll be out in four. If my sister and my auntie can do time, so can I. Joe rubs his forehead. There will be no cuffs today, Lamorna. Really? she asks. Why? Jack Crowless did die of poisoning and subsequent strangulation by the dog collar, but the poison that finished him off, well, almost finished him off, was not Brugmansia. And you know that for sure? 
She doesn't look relieved. She looks... nervous. 100% positive. She sits back in her chair, looking a little like the wind has been taken out of her sails. Joe lets her have a moment. She doesn't need one. She rallies. Well, I for one am glad he's dead. At least Donna is free now. And now it all makes sense. Is that why you did it? To free her? He asks. Her left shoulder shrugs. Of course. It frees her to love again. There's a silence. A moment of peace. She tips her head to one side and smiles. You and Donna were once madly in love, weren't you? She says. Like that film with Bing Crosby and Grace Kelly. High society. Donna loves that film, especially the bit when they're on the boat, in love and happy. Just like when the two of you used to go out on your boat. Joe narrows his eyes. Did Donna tell you that? Lamorna shakes her head. She didn't need to. It's all in her diary. Ah, uh, yes, he says. The infamous Bella Donna Nightshade Diaries. I'm not so sure Donna would have said that we were desperately in love, though. He's fishing, clearly. She did. Cross my heart. But for your part? Were you desperately in love? Why lie? For my part, yes. I loved her. Desperately? Desperately. Ruby lands on Lamorna's shoulder and nuzzles into her neck. A feather drops onto the table. I wish, I do so wish that you and Donna could make up, says Lamorna. Joe picks up the feather. I think you're forgetting something, he says. I'm in her book. Ruby squawks and Lamorna shakes her head. No, you aren't. Interesting. How do you know? Oh, Joe, for a police officer, you're not so bright. I've read all of them. All of them? Th the diaries? How many has she written? Not just my sister's diaries. I mean, I've read all the Belladonna Nightshade diaries. They're supposed to be written in pirate speak, which makes them a little difficult to translate sometimes, but somebody had to read them. They go back for hundreds of years. Donna makes out that she's read them too, but I know she hasn't. She's too impatient to sit and read shelf after shelf of books, so I thought I'd better read them, just in case there was something important inside. And was there? Lamorna winks. Oh, yes, definitely. Joe looks at Lamorna with a new respect. Maybe she's not quite so naive. I remember the day you were born, he says. Donna, she was inconsolable at the loss of her mother, your mother, but delighted to meet you at the same time. And then you arrested her, states Lamorna. Will he ever be free of it? Not on that day, but yes, shortly afterwards, I arrested her. But you did it because you loved her she says, placing a soft, cold hand on his. To get her away from Uncle Jack, didn't you? You wanted to help her towards a new life, even though, in doing so, you knew you were losing the love of your life forever. I think it was utterly selfless of you. Only a man truly in love would do such a selfless thing. Joe glances down at the hand. I doubt your sister would agree. She doesn't. That's that, then. It's time to wrap this up, thinks Joe. Whatever happened, he's gone now, says Joe. Lamorna smiles her brightest smile. She holds up a hand for a high five. He certainly has. Joe laughs and high fives her back. Better not tell the inspector I did that, he says. She shakes her head. Your secret is safe with me. Are you at least going to arrest me for attempted murder? I did try to kill him, and I did poison him and 
batter him off a precipice with a stop sign. For the very first time in his career, Joe realises with a flash of, if not horror, then sad inevitability, that he has no intention of going by the book this time. Yes, he really should take Lamorna straight down to the station to at least make a statement. But really, how can he? The poor kid lost her mother at birth, was raised by wolves. Well, a hippie and an eccentric uncle while Donna was in prison, and then by Donna when she got out, so it amounts to the same thing. And has had to live with the fact that her other aunt is in the clink for attempted murder. No, he can't do it. He can't arrest this young woman, a young woman who is clearly very different, clearly very gifted, and clearly very special. And Donna would never forgive him, either. I'm not going to arrest you, Lamorna. But I've made no notes, there's no recording of our chat, so if you don't tell anyone, including Donna, nor will I. You're doing this for her, aren't you? she says. Joe is saved by the bell when his phone pings. It's a message from Demelza. The climber reckons that the cliffs can't be scaled without a rope anymore because a ledge came loose last year. Oh, and forensics have found a teeny tiny bit of bird's feather, red in colour, between Thomas and the track. He turns away and texts back. Thomas? Who's Thomas? The reply comes a few seconds later. The tank engine, the one found on Jack in the kennel, the train and the track were glued together. Joe puts his phone away and swishes his jacket off the back of the chair. He's still holding the feather. Just promise me you won't go around plotting any more murders, eh? Lamorna laughs. It's a lovely, wild, free, joyful laugh. Scout's on her, she says. I'll even shake on it. Joe walks to the door. He pauses and glances back as he slips his arms through the jacket sleeves. Lamorna and Ruby are watching him. Thanks for the feather, he says, giving it a flourish. And just to confirm, you've never seen my name in Donna's book. He turns the handle to the cafe's door. There's no red line through my name anywhere in there. Lamorna smiles and shakes her head. No one by the name of Joe Ennis has ever been cursed in the nightshade book of ye deadly wreckers curses. Jack was. He was cursed by Auntie Donna and by my sister and Aunt Carenza. Uncle Jago even squeezed a curse in there, so Jack didn't stand a chance, really. And that new chap... Jace Clarkson has been cursed, but not you. There was a Joseph Pitt Ennis back in 1782, an ancestor of yours, I believe, but that's not you. Unless you're a time traveller, which would be cool, and if you are, you must tell me, because I'd be happy to be your sidekick, no question. Joe smiles. He is so happy right now. Jace Clarkson is in Donna's book. I'm not a time traveller, I'm afraid, he says. Sorry. Pity, but if you were, would I be the perfect person to travel with you? You'd be the first person I'd ask, he says, and somehow means it. Goodbye, Lamorna, and goodbye, Ruby, he adds, as Lamorna waves goodbye. Despite everything he's just heard, as Joe walks out of the door, he's not entirely sure that he's any further forward than when he walked in. Chapter 21 Donna It's 2pm and I'm back in the glass house at Penberth, which is becoming less of a flower farm and more of a detective agency HQ. Be careful what you wish for, isn't that what they say? Jack Crowless has been dead less than 24 hours and I'm up to my eyeballs in suspects. The most obvious one being myself. I tap my fingers on the table and wonder if this detective malarkey might not be so simple after all. The worst thing about this whole business, 
because to be clear, I'm thrilled to bits that Jack is dead, is that I'm beginning to wonder if I know my friends and family at all. Uncle Jago has lied to me, and Lamorna and Carenza aren't home yet, which is strange, especially as Carenza hasn't popped in to collect her lollipop lady garb and school is out in less than an hour. None of my family owns a mobile phone. They see phones as nothing but a tether. And if Carenza isn't back by 3pm, I'm going to have to don a lollipop lady jacket sharpish and hotfoot it to the local school. I'm also going to have to declare both of them AWOL and mark them down in my special detective notepad as suspects. The margin note in the shaman book is a little disquieting as, come on, it must have been Carenza who wrote it. And if I'm honest with myself, even Lamorna has a look sometimes that might be construed as a little edgy, unpredictable, marginally unhinged. As for the others, my players, any one of them could have got their hands on Atropa Belladonna, which grows like wildfire at Penberth, and a vial of lethal poison could easily have been put together via means of instructions on the internet. The door goes. It's Pete, and he's brought coffee. I close the laptop lid. Was on? Was on? He sits on Joe's stool and passes the coffee across the table. Thought you might need one of these today, he says. It's a double shot. When he sits back down on the stool, I swear the Brugmansia reaches out a stem and brushes his shoulder. That plant does have a way of wanting to leave its mark on people. I look into the cup to see a flat white with a heart motif on top. How come it's so hot? I ask. I'm just up the road today, he says. I parked the van outside the Minac to cash in on the action. Thought there'd be lots of people heading up that way today for a goof, you know. And are there? Tons. No one's allowed in, though. The police are still crawling all over the place. I think of Joe, sitting there, on the same stool, just a few hours ago, looking gorgeous. That journalist fella is up there too, says Pete. I inform my hackles to calm down. Jace Clarkson? Yep. Pete unfastens his tatty, army-style jacket. It's one he's had for years, and if I ever saw him wear anything else, I'm not sure I'd cope. He bought coffee for all the coppers, and even dug deep for an almond croissant for them all. Not complaining, though. He cleared me out. Did you see the article? I ask. The one about me? Pete nods. I'd watch your step with him, if I were you. Why? What do you know? Just rumours. People chatting by the wagon, that kind of thing. Let's just say he's the sort of man to have quite a few fingers in quite a few pies, and not all of them legit. He might see you as a threat. I laugh. Me? Why? Because you're the Queen of Cornwall, obviously. Nah, surely not. Nice idea, though. Me? Don't be daft. No, seriously, you are. For this part of Cornwall, at any rate. And if someone new rocks up and wants to be king... They'd need to topple the Queen first, I say. You'll be on your guard then, yeah? He says. I blow out a sigh. As the prime suspect for Jack's murder, I'm already doing that. We're all suspects, Donna, but here's a tidbit for you. Pete leans forward. Jace Clarkson was there last night, in the audience, and he came to the dressing room about halfway through the second half. Did he now? How did he get past the Minac staff? He used his press pass told them you'd agreed he could have a quick chat with us for a piece he was doing for the packet. I never agreed to that. What an arsehole. What happened? Pete laughs. Gabby told him to get lost. She could be quite feisty when her dander's up. She spent too much time with the rougher side of society, I say. It's rubbed off a bit. Did you see him leave? 
Pete shakes his head. I went on the stage to do my next bit and I left him in there. Who with? Gabby and Kat. Did you tell the police? No way. Well, that's one more suspect to add to the list. A thought crosses my mind. Pete, at the rehearsal the other day, Kat wanted to see you about something. Was anything wrong? Only she seemed a bit... He closes his eyes and shakes his head. It was nothing. Cat can be a pain in the arse. Forget it. Come on then. How was it done, do you think? You must have come up with something by now. I have indeed. The how, at least, if not the by whom or the why. First, he was poisoned. Poisoned? repeats Pete, who's gone a lighter shade of pale. What kind of poison? Did they say? Hmm. How much shall I tell him, I wonder? Everything. He's a mate. Brugmansia, which I have here, obviously, and also deadly nightshade. If Pete was pale before, he's translucent now. Deadly... What did you say? Deadly nightshade. You know, the plant. Then he was strangled by the dog collar and stabbed for good measure. It's so elaborate. Why not just kill him quickly with the knife? I'll tell you why, he says, and I sense his legs start to shake under the table. Pete does this when he's nervous. It's because, out of all of us, except for Jace Clarkson, I'm the only one who had access to the stage, who would be strong enough to get away with attacking him with a knife if he wasn't already drugged. And did you? The words are out before I can haul them back in. We hear the door go. Pete looks at me, and it's a look of absolute disappointment. I feel ashamed. Carenza slides in and cuts through the moment. You're back, I say my voice overly enthusiastic. Thank goodness, I was getting worried. She grabs her lollipop lady coat and slips it on over Kate Hudson yoga gear. That's new. And expensive. Oh, hello, Pete, she says. Lovely to see you. She flicks her long mane out of the coat and over her shoulder. You were worried about me? But why? I only went to the prison to give Auntie Donna the good news. I'm sure I told you. She did, but paranoia is my new best friend. You did, sorry, it's been an odd day. She kisses me on the head. I'll cleanse your chakras later. That'll make you feel better. Have you seen the nail scissors, by the way? I'm just about to say, do tell me about the margin notes in this book when she grabs a pair of nail scissors from the drawer and floats out of the door. Which is when Lamorna and Ruby float in. Buses. I try to learn from my previous error of paranoia-fed worry and say not a word, although, and where the hell have you been all day, is hovering on the end of my tongue. Good day, I ask. I'm given a bear hug in answer and a kiss on the cheek before Lamorna skips off to collect her ukulele from the far end of the glasshouse. I'd better be off, says Pete, standing. He looks gutted. I'm such an idiot. But you'll remember what I said about Jace Clarkson, he says. Yeah? Of course. And about Cat, he says. Do you think she'll be staying on after? As one of the players, you mean? He shrugs. Why? I ask. No reason, except I might call it a day myself this year. I'm not much of an actor. Hmm. He turns to walk away. I shout after him. Pete, you're coming to my birthday party next week, yeah? He shrugs. Should think so, he says, and turns to walk away again. The man can't get out quickly enough. Oh, and Pete? He stops again and sighs. Lots of people come here for a coffee, 
I say, which I love, but it does end up feeling like I run a cafe sometimes. You're the only person to ever bring one to me, and I don't deserve it. His head drops. Don't apologise, he says. Just don't. And then he dashes away, leaving the door open behind him. Lamorna takes his seat, Joe's seat, and nods to Pete's jacket, which he's left on the table. I grab it and dart out, but as I head out of the walled garden and towards the driveway, I see Uncle Jago rushing towards Pete from the house, and something in Jago's anxious expression tells me to stop and watch. They talk in hushed, urgent voices. Pete runs a hand through his hair and says, I knew I should never have got involved. I'll go down for this, Jago. It's only a matter of time before they trace it all back to me. Jago grabs Pete's arm, not a little aggressively, and says, Just hold your nerve, lad. Pete shrugs him off. Jago puts his face in his hands, and Pete walks away down the drive. Interesting. I look down at Pete's coat in my hands. A quick rifle through the pockets wouldn't harm anyone, would it? I go to my swing seat and start the search. Army jackets have a lot of pockets. Here's what I've found. The article about me in the newspaper, folded into four. I don't want to think about why that's there right now. Half a packet of chewing gum, a betting slip, Slippery slope, Pete. A receipt from Lidl for cider. Oh, and a Wikipedia page about Atropa Belladonna. Jesus Christ. I make sure to put everything back in the pocket it came out of and wander back into the glass house. Lamorna is channeling Joni Mitchell. Both sides now. So, there are two essential things in life that go hand in hand with Joni Mitchell booze and cigarettes, and there has been a packet of untouched Marlboro lights and a lighter in the back of the odds and ends drawer for over a year. I put Pete's coat on the bench exactly as he left it and decide that perhaps today is the one day I could forgive myself for having a bit of a smoke. There's also a rather fine bottle of Merlot hidden away in Carenza's secret stash of booze at the back of the raffia ribbons and bows cupboard. I get the wine first and pour a glass, then go for the Marlboros. The drawer isn't one we often use, and it's stuck. I open the cupboard that sits underneath the drawer and feel upwards blindly to see if I can release the drawer from underneath. There's something fixed to the underside of the drawer. I grab a torch and my pruning knife, not the one used to stab Jack in the neck. The police have kept that get on my back and edge into the cupboard, looking up. What I find does not lighten my mood. The torch illuminates a plastic bag of industrial zip ties, which have been taped to the underside of the drawer. I cut away the tape and put the zip ties on the table next to the wine glass. Lamorna glances up from the guitar, frowns, then returns to the music. I light a cigarette, rest my right elbow on the table, rest my temple on the heel of my hand, and allow the smoke to drift around the room while wondering if the zip ties were planted to stitch me up. This is getting out of control. I'm getting out of control. I need help, and there's only one person I can turn to now. Only one person I can trust. And that's really bloody annoying. I fire out a text. I'm out of my depth and think I'm being set up. Will you help me? Less than a minute goes by before my phone pings. Meet me at Jack's house in Newlyn at 7.30pm tonight. I analyse the text. Joe hasn't said that he'll help, but then he hasn't said that he won't. I've got nothing to lose and reply. See you there. P.S. Jace Clarkson was backstage during the second half of the play. I feel Lamorna's eyes on me. I don't look up. She ups the tempo and changes the words of the song slightly. Tears and fears and feeling proud. Just say I love you 
right out loud. I stub out the cigarette and pour the wine back into the bottle. I can't do that, Lamorna, I say, just as Pete rushes in and grabs his coat off the bench. I just can't do that. Chapter 22 Donna Once Carenza's lollipop lady duties are done for the day, I gather my family together in the manor's kitchen. It's a fabulous, almost baronial room, full of freestanding oak units, hanging copper pans, fresh herbs, spices and recipe books. Meat hooks are secured into beams, where old retainers would have hung game to cure, and where, according to her diary, and therefore, according to Lamorna, great-great-great-granny Nightshade strung up a rival pirate and watched on as the last putrid breath spilled out of his windpipe. I'd write it off as fiction, but if you look hard enough, there's still the blood stain on the slate floor beneath the beam. We don't hang a pan on that meat hook. So yes, the kitchen is untouched by time, except for the four oven aga and the east-facing French doors that Auntie Donna put in, which was a great decision. They fill the room with much-needed light and warmth, particularly in the morning, when we sit and have breakfast and chew over the jobs for the day. Other than the walled garden, the kitchen is my favourite space here, but it's pretty much Uncle Jago's domain, as he's the chef of the family. And here he is now, serving up a late afternoon tea of griddled Irish scones, cheese and homemade chutney. I glance around. Lamorna, Carenza, Ruby and Jago are all gathered around the table, happily chatting away and tucking into high tea. You'd think Uncle Jack had never returned, let alone been slotted last night. And, all credit to us, we're quite a practical family, and there's no point faking grief. We hated him. He's gone. We're delighted. Nevertheless, I put down my scone. It's best to get straight to the point. The thing is, we need to quickly explain to each other exactly and truthfully what we each of us were doing yesterday during the play so that we know we're in the clear. And if anyone asks... Anyone? Like the police, you mean? This from Jago. Well, yes, the police. But as I was saying, if anyone asks, we know that we'll be giving a unified response. If you're guilty, just tell me. I'll understand and we'll deal with it. No one responds. Everyone looks down at the table. Stripped pine. Jago is the first to break the silence by standing and heading to the arga to take the whistling kettle off the heat. His tone surprises me when he speaks. He's not himself today. His hand starts to shake as he pours the water into the teapot. Donna Nightshade, he begins. If you want to know if one of us killed Jack Crowless, then I wish you'd just jolly well come out with it and ask us. Wasn't that what I just did? All right, I'll say it plainly. Did anyone around this table murder Jack Crowless? Two pairs of eyes head to the table again. Murmured denials escape from Lamorna and Carenza. Jago is indignant as he pours the tea. All I shall say is this, he says, and I know full well that it certainly will not be all that he says. Whoever did it deserves a medal. Well, this is more awkward than I'd imagined. I'm going to have to be frank. Look, I've been talking to Joe Ennis. I begin. Knowing glances are handed around and picked up like dealt cards. I thought he was in your book, says Carenza. I knew that would come up. He isn't, says Lamorna. And the harsh fact is that the person most likely to have the means of accessing the stage and killing him was one of us. Persons, corrects Lamorna. What? You're assuming that just one person is involved. There might have been several. She's got a point. All right. The fact is that the person, or 
persons most likely to have done it was one or more of us. And by us, I mean the family and the players. Like it or not, we're all murder suspects. And Jace Clarkson, too. The Bounder? asks Jago. The Bounder, I confirm. I'm not a suspect, pipes up Carenza. I wasn't even there. I was teaching my Zoom yoga class back here. Can you prove it? I ask, taking out my notebook. Of course I can. Just ask any of my clients. And how long did the yoga classes last for? From seven in the evening until midnight. Midnight? Australian clients, she explains. At least that's one ticked off. Great, I say. So how, um, was it actually done? Asks Carenza. Was it wonderfully gruesome? I take a bite of my scone before answering. Jago's baking gets better and better. I really ought to put him up for Bake Off because he'd win, no question. And the subsequent book and TV deals would be lucrative. I wipe my mouth with the back of my hand. Jago offers me a napkin with an associated tut. It's looking like he was drugged twice, then strangled by the dog collar, presumably by the swelling of his neck because of the reaction to the poison. I don't think he was dead before the knife. My knife, by the way, went in. Carenza's face is pure confusion. But wait a minute. He was drugged twice, you say? And by two different types of drugs, dips in Lamorna. Yes, as I said, drugged twice, but not necessarily both times in the kennel. And both drugs were extracted from plants that could be found here at Penberth. Brugmansia and Atropa belladonna. Our calling cards, says Uncle Jago. Exactly, I say. It's so odd. Not really, says Lamorna, who, having polished off her scone, pops some crumbs on the table for Ruby to eat and, dabbing her mouth, says, not when you consider the fact that I administered the Brugmansia. There is a moment during which speech is beyond me. Eventually, I turn to her. What? Why? Why would you do that? She shrugs. To frighten him? To kill him? Who can really tell what one's motives are in these situations? Murder is easy. Isn't that what Agatha Christie said? And if she didn't, it's exactly the sort of thing she would have said, so the quote stands. I look at the others. They are open-mouthed. I think she's joking, but to my horror, I realise that she isn't. Words need to form. I begin with, Why didn't you tell me this when I asked you about your actions five minutes ago? Because you asked if any of us had killed him, she answers, looking far too relaxed. If you had asked if I'd tried to poison him the day before he died, I would have said yes. She nods towards Carenza. It was all Aunt Carenza's idea, wasn't it, Aunt Carenza? Carenza, her mouth still gaping open, glances from me to Lamorna several times before she says, Well, yes. Lamorna goes on to explain how, after a bizarre ceremony on Logan Rock, Jack, having been drugged with Brugmansia that was both hidden inside a pasty and administered to a pint at the star, was lured there with offers of sex and jewels, attacked with the lollipop lady sign, and sent off to a watery grave. I'm sorry to admit it, she says, but the plan was flawed. He only fell a few feet before he hit the water. We forgot about the tide issue, you see. We just wanted to show him that he couldn't start messing about with the nightshades, didn't we, Carenza? Suum quique, you said, and all that. Carenza nods her agreement reluctantly, looking awkward. As well she might. Lamorna turns to me. And anyway, didn't you always say that if he ever came back, we'd kill him? I did say that, yes. Jago pipes up, scratching his head. He must have thought it was someone else on the rock, though 
or surely he would have come straight here to string us all up. Good point. Oh, but I would have been ready for him if he had, never you fear, says Lamorna. Is that why you carried the cutlass all day? I ask. That's why I carried a cutlass all day, she confirms. I can't speak. Anyhow, there's nothing to worry about now, adds Lamorna. Oh, really? How so, little sister? She shrugs, her face pure innocence. Because I told that nice police chap, Joe Ennis, all about it, and he said that I wasn't to worry. What? shouts Carenza. Don't worry, I didn't tell Joe about you being there too, Lamorna laughs. There was no need for both of us to be sent down. I simply told him about my part in it. Why on earth would you do that? I ask. I suppose I just felt that it was best to come clean. I wouldn't have gone to prison for long. And Auntie Donna would have looked after me. Stopped me from becoming some other woman's bitch or something. Jago gets a bottle of brandy from the baking cupboard and pours a measure into my tea. I need to gather my wits. And Joe knows all of this already? I ask. She nods the affirmation of a child who is confirming that they have been good. I gave him my full confession this morning. This morning? I waited for him at the Minac. I look at Carenza. She's gone deathly pale, and her expression is utterly unfathomable. I turn to Lamorna. At least she's still got her wits about her. Well, kind of. And? He was very good about it, actually. I have entered a surreal dream. I'll wake up in a minute. He did say that it would probably be a good idea if I didn't go around drugging people as a matter of course and then hitting them with lollipop stop signs, although it was Carenza who did the actual hitting. Oh, and she wore the cape. I put my head in my hands. It's all my fault. I've brought her up like a feral cat. You should have told me, I murmur into my hands. I would never have let you go. Lamorna stands, walks round the table and puts her arms around me. Donna, my wonderful sister, you are not responsible for my or anyone else's actions. She nods towards Carenza. We are all free spirits allowed to make our own choices and our own mistakes, aren't we, auntie? Carenza is still mute. But why? I ask. Why did you do it? Again, Lamorna simply shrugs. To be perfectly honest, I just didn't like him. Twenty minutes later, and I've gathered myself together enough to make sure that my family's alibis are watertight. Carenza was giving yoga classes from the turret room here at Penberth on Zoom. I checked with legit clients in Australia. It's a very distinctive room, so that's that sorted. Lamorna was in the music tent all night, and her silhouette could be seen by the audience throughout the performance. And as for Jago, well, he was chasing down a piglet at Nanjizzle Cove, although no one saw him there, and the story of his expedition is becoming more and more embroidered every time he tells it. I simply don't believe him. He starts to clear the plates. I stand. Where are you going now? asks Jago. This could be tricky. Should I lie or... I've got some pricking out to do in the big polytunnel, I say. The hardy annuals? asks Carenza. That's a big job. I'll help you. Hmm. And then I'm off to Newlyn. To meet Joe. Ennis? say Jago and Carenza at the same time, both looking disappointed. I head towards the door and throw a yes over my shoulder. Carenza sighs. You do know that Auntie Donna would not approve of you knocking about with that policeman, she says. Her free spirit Buddhist tiara is definitely slipping. That's all right, I say because Auntie Donna's not here, is she? 
I turned to face them at the door. I'm the queen of the castle now, and if you all keep your mouths shut about it, she'll never know. Carenza looks at Jago. Jago looks at Carenza. And Lamorna, well, she just smiles her wonderful smile and says, we'll not wait up. Which should be the final word, except that the final word is usually reserved for Ruby, and today is no exception. She takes flight, heads towards me like a peregrine falcon jumping off a cliff with eyes only for its prey, and with a handbrake turn landing on my shoulder, she says, Donna did it! Donna did it! Despite it clearly being a mad joke on Ruby's behalf, she's like that, is Ruby. A sick sense of humour. They all throw their best knowing glances in my direction. What? You can't really think... Jago turns his back to me. We'd be lying if we didn't admit that it hadn't crossed our minds, he murmurs. And that's all of you, is it? I ask, glancing around. They all shrug. For Christ's sake, Ruby. That's all I need. Chapter 23 It's early evening, and Detective Sergeant Joe Ennis, who doesn't realise he's smiling to himself, cuts a pace through the Cornish countryside as he heads towards Newlyn and his rendezvous with Donna Nightshade. The hours that have passed since leaving Lamorna at the Minac Theatre have not been without productivity. He caught a couple of Pollock off Senan, and Demelza has come up trumps with background information on Jack, namely where he's been hiding these past few years. It seems he's been living in Lithuania, and for some of the time was banged up in prison. Poor Lithuania. The story from Demelza goes along the lines of Jack getting himself a nice little racket going until ultimately, inevitably, Interpol got wind of it. He was chased across Europe by various police forces, and yet it wasn't his smuggling, drugs and humans, that got him arrested in the end, but a simple case of dangerous driving. The details were unclear, but Joe suspected that the old copper's trick of if he can't get them for one thing, then get them on another, tenuous one, had perhaps come into play. But for all that, the Lithuania link might prove fruitful. Joe had no idea why or how right now, but he had his best man, who happened to be a woman, all over it. Jack's house is a mid-terrace fisherman's cottage halfway up Bogey Hill, Newlyn. Joe stands outside the front door with a key in his hand, and shithole is the first word that comes to his mind. It's Jack's mother's old place, and was used as a squat by all and sundry during the long years while Jack was absent. Well, the cat's away, etc. It was let to his mother on a long-term, rent-free basis by Donna's auntie Deadly, and then Donna the Younger didn't have the heart to kick out the squatters. Jack, on his return, had kicked them out, literally using his size nines, without a moment's hesitation. Two of Joe's team have already done a search of the house, looking for Jack's mobile phone primarily, which, to everyone's surprise, was not tucked down his underpants in the dog suit. One of his constables put police tape across the cottage and closed and locked the door this morning to stop any prying eyes or feet from entering. As for inviting Donna to the scene, well, what's a man to do? Put the cuffs on, Joe. That's what a man has to do. When he arrives, he sees that the tape has been broken. A light is on downstairs, and the front door is ajar. He steps one foot inside the cottage, and his Fitbit watch beeps to tell Joe that his heart is going a bit too fast. Which is strange, considering that he's not exercising, and he feels no apprehension going into the house of a dead man. I'm through here, shouts Donna. Joe pokes his head around the lounge door. Donna is rifling through a sideboard. At least she's wearing gloves. Gardening, but it's better than nothing. The cottage has two rooms downstairs, a lounge and a kitchen. Neither has had a clean-up since it was a squat, 
although maybe it was clean as a whistle as a squat, and this was how Jack lived in the brief time he was back. Joe crosses the room to join Donna. She doesn't look up. How long have you been here? he asks, noting that most of the drawers are open and Donna has a pile of papers in her hand. About an hour. For Christ's sake. Donna, Jesus, I said... What? I just wanted to get ahead of the game, that's all. And I took all the right precautions, so don't worry. Look, I'm even wearing gloves. She shakes jazz hands in his direction. Your own guys have made a right pig's ear of the place already, so no one will have any idea that I was here. At least tell me the door was open and you didn't break in. Donna puts the pile of papers down on the sideboard and faces him somewhat defiantly, if a little flirtatiously. Don't buckle to it, Joe. Just don't buckle. Break in, she repeats. Not at all, officer. She reaches into a pocket. This house is a Penberth estate cottage, and I still have the spare key. She holds it up to show him. That old door hasn't been changed in 80 years. She returns to her occupation of searching through the detritus of Jack's sideboard. Anyway, Uncle Jack was one of the family, and this place belongs to us. He glances around. It really is a shithole. But in Newlyn, it will probably be worth a mint. What will you do with it? He asks. Donna shrugs. Tidy it up and rent it out to a local. Joe remembers what Bill Smiley said about Donna being strapped for cash. Or you could sell it for a packet. Newlyn is quite the des res these days. Donna stops rifling and gives Joe her hard stare. You mean flog it off as a second home to some rich tosser who'll rock up in his Range Rover once in a blue moon, not pay a penny in council tax, then get bored of it and sell it on for a massive profit? Never. She picks up the pile of papers from the sideboard. Let's go into the garden, she says. I want to show you something, and the smell in here is making me want to barf. What do you think the numbers mean? asks Donna who's looking over Joe's shoulder as they sit together on a low stone wall in the backyard. No idea, says Joe, who is flicking through a pile of handwritten notes Donna found in the sideboard. Each piece of paper, Basil and Bond, good quality letter paper, deduces Donna, holding one up to the light to see the watermark, has nothing more than numbers on it. And there were no envelopes with them? Donna shakes her head. No, maybe it's some kind of code or coordinates for a drop or something. Possibly, agrees Joe, a little absently. He takes a plastic evidence bag out of his jacket pocket and bags up the notes. I'll get the team on it and have them checked for prints, see what that brings up. Donna rolls her eyes. Nothing, that's what checking them for prints will bring up. As if the sender would have been that daft. You'd be surprised how stupid people can be, says Joe. What were you looking for, anyway? Looking for? Yes, Donna, looking for. And don't start playing games again. I thought we were working on this together. All right, all right. I was looking for evidence of threats. Threats? I told you. Jack came to me and said someone had been sending him death threats and he wanted me to find out who it was. I thought I might find blackmail letters in here or something like that. Joe smiles. He tries desperately not to patronise her, but... Donna, if Jack was being blackmailed, it would have been done on the phone. By text from a pay-as-you-go number, most likely. Do you know that for sure? No. His phone is missing. All we know was that he had the latest model of iPhone on a contract with EE. Donna sighs. Basically, we're looking for someone who had access to the stage, who hated Jack, has a taste for brewing up poison, and who was waltzing around Cornwall with a new iPhone in their pocket. Pretty much, although I doubt they'd keep the phone. Why? Too risky. It's probably sitting at the bottom of the ocean by now. 
there's a moment's silence, which is too difficult for Joe to bear. So he stands up and says, Come on, Sherlock, lots to do. Let's have another gander around the place. The gander proves fruitless. Turning over the house simply proves what they already know. Jack Crowless was a gluttonous slob who liked to partake in a line of coke and was best mates with the local bookmaker. There's no laptop, no notebook, nothing at all other than empty pizza boxes, beer cans and those peculiar pieces of paper with the numbers on. All his dodgy dealings were obviously kept in his head and on his phone. The street lights are on by the time they step outside. Donna locks the door while Joe fiddles with his tie, wondering how to end the rendezvous. Should he invite her to the pub? Nah, too public. Should he invite her back to his place? God no, she'd laugh in his face. Should he... Fancy a walk along the prom towards town, she says, putting the key in her pocket and looking up at him warmly. I could buy you some chips. They head down the hill towards Newlyn Harbour. Only, I wanted to say thanks. She glances around. For the mourner, she whispers. For letting her off the hook, you know, what with her, well, her attempt to murder Jack. Joe coughs nervously. She told you about that then, he says, while thinking, shit, I should never have been so lax. She wasn't supposed to tell you. Don't worry, says Donna, who has begun walking again. Your secret's safe with me. But I can't believe she did it. It honestly doesn't compute in my brain. And the whole thing has got me thinking... Perhaps I don't know the people around me as much as I thought I did. As they walk past the harbour, a man is preparing a small yacht for departure. It's that damn Jace Clarkson, off to do some night fishing, no doubt. Donna hasn't seen Jace and is still talking. Which is a tricky thing to come to terms with, you know, not really knowing the reality behind the people you thought you knew. Thought you knew like the back of your hand but then who really knows the back of their hand? You could show me ten pictures of the backs of hands and I bet I wouldn't know which one was mine. Yes, exactly, murmurs Joe, hurrying his steps and trying to walk in a way that hides Donna from line of sight with Jace. They arrive at the chippy. Closed, says Joe. Donna turns to him. You know, Joe... I've got a sinking feeling that whoever it was that killed Jack did it for me. Donna. No, hear me out. Just look at what Lamorna tried to do to him, simply to protect me. I think you're barking up the wrong tree, he says, instantly regretting the doggy metaphor. It's not a strong enough motive. They all love you dearly, but trust me, if one of your friends or family killed him, it wasn't for you. No one is that nice. It was for themselves. Unless someone was trying to kill Uncle Jago and accidentally killed Jack instead. Joe shakes his head again. I thought of that, but when they went into the kennel, they would have seen that it was Jack, not Jago. He had the hood off. Whoever murdered Jack pulled the dog suit down and stabbed him up the nose with a needle. Pretty hard to get the wrong man. They stand and stare at the closed chip shop. No chips, says Joe. No chips, repeats Donna. She turns to face him. It's a matter of trust, she says, her eyes misty. Trust no one, he says as they begin to walk again. Not even you, she asks. Since when did you trust me? Donna doesn't answer. They retrace their steps and stroll towards the harbour in silence. He's never seen Donna looking this way. What way? he asks himself. Vulnerable, he replies. His phone pings. It's Demelza. She sent him a photo and a text. Got this from Scotland Yard. Taken in Lithuania a couple of years ago by Interpol. Recognise anyone? 
Joe stops walking and zooms in to assess the photo. Gabby, Donna's vicar friend, the woman who denied any knowledge of how a stash of drugs found its way into her rucksack, is front and centre in the scene. She's wearing a thick coat and a bobble hat, but it's definitely her. She's talking to Jack Crowless, arguing with him by the looks of the hand gestures, and they're standing outside what looks like a bar. Is it about Jack? asks Donna, nodding towards his phone. There is no way Joe can show her this photo. For so many reasons, not least because he's a police officer and she isn't. Yes, but only that he's been traced to a Lithuanian prison. They reach the harbour wall and the surprises just keep coming. <laughs>